Okay. All right, I think we'll call the meeting to order. If everyone is set uh, for that. Um, actually, the first order of business is really going to be to turn it to Eric just for uh, a couple of moments, and then I'll make a few comments before we carry on here. Great. Uh, thank you. And that's why I was turning this on. I think it's a little loud, but because I'm going to come around. Uh, before I uh, give you my, uh, my report, um, let me um, point out to you on the inside of your notebooks is the information uh, for wireless access in this facility. Um, and, uh, and so you should uh, make note of that so you can uh, have access to wireless uh, while you're here. And of course, I should begin by thanking the Ohio State University for uh, graciously hosting us here today. Um, uh, Judge Marbley, uh, who is uh, our, uh, one of our co-chairs, uh, and, uh, uh, and is a trustee of The Ohio State University, made the arrangements for us to be here today. He's unfortunately not here today, as you've noticed, so we thank, uh, we thank Judge Marbley for having arranged this, and of course, uh, President Gee, who's a member of our commission, is also unfortunately not here today, but uh, was also involved uh, in making these arrangements uh, for us today. So thank you both to Judge Marbley and to uh, President Gee for letting us be in this incredibly beautiful facility. It's a wonderful setting for our, uh, for our meeting today and as you can imagine all the logistics uh, and cooperation that we've received from uh, the team here at the Ohio Union uh, has been uh, very, very uh, much appreciated. So you've got the information on the wireless. Uh, I also uh, want to just remind everybody to please share the mics so when you're speaking, um, you're speaking into a microphone so that we can pick it up for the uh, for the folks who are watching us uh, on the internet uh, and uh, and following the uh, following the proceedings, um, I also um, want to uh, note that uh, we have a few uh, folks representing commission members here today. I've already mentioned that Judge Marbley is unfortunately uh, not able to be here today, uh, and uh, uh, we are joined uh, from his office by Robert Shakovny. Uh, so thank you uh, very much for Rob for you being here today with us. Uh, Mary Lou Langenhop is also uh, uh, traveling today, and she's represented by Charlie Kozleski. As uh, Charlie's here, thank you. Uh, and uh, and finally, Pat Lazinski uh, is uh, is out on the road doing whatever library directors do when they're not in uh, their home uh, in their home base. Uh, and uh, Allison Circle uh, is uh, is here. Many of us know Allison uh, representing uh, representing uh, Pat. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Madam Chair and members of the Commission, uh, let me just uh, give you a quick report uh, uh, on, our, uh, uh, on our work so far and the matters that you've referred to us for your activity. Uh, these are uh, the uh, things that I'm going to cover quickly with you uh, in, um, uh, in my report to you. Um, and uh, let me just uh, begin. Uh, we, of course, uh, did uh, talk about early childhood uh, education uh, last, um, uh, last week. I think I'll come around uh, and, um, uh, and uh, receive some important information um, about uh, the importance of, uh, of this issue, uh, both the, uh, relative to the, uh, uh, to the uh, readiness of students in kindergarten um, and also the uh, participation, uh, the ability of students to meet the third grade reading guarantee. This is some of what we, uh, some of what we heard, <coughs> just as a reminder, at our uh, commission meeting. Uh, uh, Mark, of course, uh, talked about uh, how uh, a, uh, uh, we know that we've got to get to them early uh, because the costs of remediation grow as we, uh, as we move forward. Um, uh, as it gets older. Uh, we know that uh, children who arrive, who arrive in kindergarten prepared to learn are less likely to need extra help uh, and less likely uh, to have to repeat a grade uh, and more likely uh, to read uh, at grade level. Um, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and so the uh, commission recommended uh, that, we, uh, that we explore strategies to expand early childhood education. That would be a core part of our report. Uh, and we will, uh, and the staff is working on those issues, as I'll note in a moment. Uh, the second, uh, a second uh, a finding, if you will, or uh, learning from the uh, from our first meeting had to do with the role of principals 
uh, and uh, that terrific presentation we had from uh, our two principals uh, regarding uh, the strong leadership uh, and uh, sorry for the, uh, that that picture is so dark, but uh, you'll uh, recognize one of our principals uh, said uh, that you can have a building full of fantastic teachers, uh, but if you don't have the right leader, you'll just have a mediocre building. Um, and, uh, and this was an important uh, a finding of our uh, hearing last week or meeting last week. And finally, uh, Bart Anderson uh, talked to us about uh, the relative responsibilities of state uh, and local uh, policy. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I thought it important to uh, remind us that he told us that uh, actually compared to other states, Ohio uh, is a local control state, uh, which means that there's actually significant authority <laughs> Uh, to make uh, decisions and changes uh, in, um, in educational policy uh, at the local level, uh, but uh, that the state law does set rules for local schools, uh, and I would uh, note that he also pointed out that there are ways to uh, seek changes in state, uh, in state policy through waivers uh, and, uh, and other opportunities. So uh, those were, I think, uh, uh, the, the critical points that, uh, that uh, uh, we encountered at our last meeting. Uh, to date, uh, you've, uh, uh, you've given me three directives um, as, uh, as staff. Uh, the first uh, directive was um, uh, relative to uh, pursuing uh, a uh, management uh, study uh, of, uh, uh, of the operations uh, of the district. Uh, and uh, I think you uh, you've been following uh, the fact that uh, we have uh, that we have been pursuing that uh, uh, that uh, subject, uh, and uh, at the last meeting, uh, specifically, the commission directed uh, me to uh, ask the uh, school board uh, to collaborate with us uh, on that effort. Uh, and uh, I believe uh, you've probably been following the news this week and know that the school board uh, at Mrs. Perkins. Uh, uh, instigation uh, on Tuesday evening uh, did vote unanimously to uh, accept that uh, request from the uh, from the uh, commission um, and uh, each side to designate uh, someone uh, to begin <coughs> to develop the scope and the uh, and the uh, timing and uh, uh, and the method of paying for this uh, uh, for this study um, and uh, uh, our commission uh, has uh, designated uh, Mary Jo Hudson uh, who's a member of our commission, who's also unfortunately not here today, uh, but I did speak to uh, Mary Jo immediately after the council's, uh, the school board's vote on Tuesday night, uh, so she's certainly aware of that, uh, of that outcome uh, and uh, prepared to dig in as soon as she gets back into town tomorrow uh, on, that, uh, on that work, and, uh, and the uh, school board has designated Mrs. Perkins as their uh, representative on this matter, which is terrific since she's a member of our commission. Um, so uh, we are uh, prepared to move forward now uh, with, that, um, uh, with that matter. Um, you also uh, uh, passed a resolution, as I've already indicated, uh, asking for uh, uh, work on the development of a recommendation about the role of early childhood education and expanding role of early childhood education. Um, and, uh, uh, and we are uh, pursuing that um, uh, pursuing that subject, uh, and we'll certainly report back uh, when something uh, is ready uh, to be reported. And uh, there are certainly a number of members of the commission uh, who are knowledgeable uh, and uh, leaders on that subject who we, will, uh, who we are involving in the conversation so that we can uh, make sure that we're drawing on the full expertise uh, of the commission. Uh, finally, uh, uh, the suggestion was made uh, uh, by Mrs. Uh, Perkins um, that we uh, conduct uh, school visits, um, and you will find, I believe, in your notebook, is that right? Um, uh, Matt, is it in the notebook somewhere? The, uh, this is, it's not, oh, it's, but you got it by email? How did we get it? It's, it's, been, it's been sent out. So you've received, um, you've received uh, by email, uh, and if, uh, uh, if you're not sure that you got it, uh, 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 please touch base with Matt. He'll circulate around. Uh, during the day today that we have in fact uh, organized now uh, several school visits for the uh, commission members uh, to, um, uh, to undertake uh, and, uh, uh, and we will uh, be following up with you 
Uh, we do ask for RSVPs for those. We know not everybody's going to be able to come to every, uh, every one of the school visits, uh, but we, do, uh, we will appreciate um, the help. <laughs> one other matter that came up uh, during our, uh, during our uh, presentations last week that I felt was significant, even though we didn't take a formal action on it. You'll remember that Bart Anderson from the Franklin County Educational Service Commission uh, talked about the role of shared services on a regional basis. That's, in fact, one of the important roles the Educational Service Center provides. You'll remember he specifically referenced the subject of transportation uh, and the fact that uh, during the, uh, with the growth of charter schools and open enrollment that uh, the cost of transportation is becoming increasingly a regional matter and not just a school district matter. Um, and so I just wanted to, uh, to mention to the commission um, that, uh, that I felt that there was material in that presentation that also uh, required uh, warranted follow-up uh, and, and we'll do so on that matter and, uh, and if there is uh, something that we uh, feel it's appropriate to bring back to the Commission for your consideration, we'll certainly do that. But I thought that was a significant matter that, w that arose last week that frankly we hadn't anticipated, but I think it was a very, uh, a very significant uh, uh, document. Uh, yes? The, the dates that you mentioned are in the, in the, in the book. Oh, the dates and the, uh, the hearings. Thank you. I thought they were. The, uh, the school visits. Under what tab, Reverend Gilliard, are they? Uh, they're under community outreach. Oh, community outreach. Okay. So the, the school visit dates uh, are, uh, are in the tab under community outreach. <coughs> so if you did not get that um, in advance uh, by email, uh, please do uh, check your calendars, and, and uh, we would welcome uh, you know, as many commission members as possible at each of those visits, understanding, of course, that uh, not everybody's going to be able to make every update. Uh, and, uh, so here's a little update on our community outreach efforts. Uh, as, as you know, uh, this is an important part of the work of our commission. These meetings, these formal meetings of our commission, are only one piece of what we're doing to gather uh, information. Uh, we uh, now have eight community forums scheduled, uh, hosted at schools. Um, uh, Kathleen Murphy, who's here, uh, you remember Kathleen, you've all met Kathleen, uh, is organizing these, uh, these events for us together with a team of professionals that she has gathered uh, for this purpose. Um, so these meetings, as you can see, start in February, uh, and, uh, and we expect that they will be, uh, that they'll be well attended. Uh, they're in the evenings, as you can see, and we are, uh, we're looking forward to the results of those meetings. Um, we also mentioned to you uh, last, at the last meeting that, the, that Kathleen's uh, group is also organizing a series of focus groups. Um, and I'm pleased to report to you that we've had our first focus group. Uh, and uh, it was quite successful. Um, and one of the things that we do, of course, the focus group were not uh, videotaping because you have all know about focus groups. We want people to feel uh, that they are able to express themselves freely. <clears throat> and we will have a report of the focus groups that, um, that will be available to the commission. Uh, each focus group will have a report, a written report that does not mention specific names of people. However, what we have done is ask members of the focus group, uh, attendees at the focus group, if they are willing to step up to the camera uh, and identify themselves and their ideas. And uh, some folks were willing to do that. And so uh, we'd like to show you a little snippet from our uh, first focus group. Hi, my good idea is to find more creative ways to get students to have out of classroom experiences going to museums, visiting with military veterans, things that take them outside of the classroom where they get away from the pressures of all the tests that are required of them. Okay, I would like to see a stronger focus on neighborhood schools um, because then you get the community buy-in, you get parents rallying around. We have a lot of choice in Columbus, a bit too much choice, and it causes dilution in our neighborhood schools and we, we can't keep our neighborhood strong and there aren't enough students to support all the choice that we have available in our, in our city. Basically, my idea was the fact of integrating um, performance and learning so that, it, that learning maintained itself as importance in the process, because I don't feel like learning is the focus of what happens with education. Um, it's more about performance, and, and that's problematic for the process and gives us what we have now. 
We've got a number of uh, successful schools already in the Columbus School District, um, and I'd like to see the system somehow pair up successful schools with maybe some of the struggling ones. My good idea was to have parents to be required to sign contracts to work with their student, with their children in the school. I personally believe that everything begins at home, so whatever the home is, those people who are raising that child should be involved in the education. I would love to see a more integrated arts <coughs> curriculum instituted throughout our schools if possible. I just feel like there are a lot of students who may have other ways of learning and other interests that could be addressed by uh, giving them opportunities within the arts. So I think the single most important factor in the quality of a child's education is the quality in te of the teacher in front of them. So I'd ask it this way, are, and from a class size perspective, are you better off with 20 students in front of a bad teacher or 30 students in front of a good teacher? So just as a um, uh, reminder, of course, this is not a scientific uh, result of the focus group. These are people who were uh, willing to, uh, uh, to, to put a microphone on and step in front of a camera. You will get a full report of the focus group. But we thought we'd, you'd like to get a flavor of, uh, of the conversations that are starting to happen uh, in the community. I also remind you that uh, these postcards, 100,000 of them, right, Kathleen, have been printed and are being distributed across the community. Um, and uh, again, we've offered, if members of the commission have places you'd like to distribute postcards to, um, uh, either give us the names and we'll get it to them or we can get you the postcards uh, to distribute. Uh, they just went out this last week, so we haven't uh, started getting them back in yet, but we expect that we will start. And of course, uh, commission members will receive a report uh, of what we hear back through the postcard campaign. Um, uh, another element of the outreach uh, has been uh, our uh, social media uh, accounts. Uh, we've been very active, as you know, on uh, the internet, on websites, blogs, and Twitter. Uh, we now, uh, uh, according to our uh, social media uh, group, uh, have reached 117,000 different uh, accounts uh, with 310,000 uh, different impressions uh, reaching those accounts. So we are, uh, we're getting word out. It very much, just so everybody knows, it spiked around our last meeting. We expect another similar spike around this meeting. Obviously, people tune in uh, when there's something happening uh, and, and pay attention. So we're, uh, we're growing our reach. I continue to encourage everyone to uh, retweet or repost uh, uh, on your various social media outlets and invite all the organizations that are involved to, uh, to do the same. Uh, this is how we get word out by accessing each other's uh, lists. Uh, we've had 1,500 uh, unique uh, uh, visitors to our website, uh, which again, for an organization that's only a month or so old, is, uh, uh, is pretty good. Uh, we've been posting uh, uh, comments from our commissioners. Uh, each of you will be asked uh, in turn uh, to uh, give us some of your thoughts so that we can, uh, we can put them up uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the website. Uh, but certainly, you don't need to wait for us to corner you. Uh, feel free to volunteer yourselves to, uh, uh, to, uh, to have something uh, put on the website uh, for you. Um, I mentioned school tours, uh, uh, and I forgot I had uh, more detail in the slides. Uh, uh, as, I, as you have in your notebook, uh, we've, uh, uh, we've arranged six uh, tours of high-performing local schools, uh, and uh, the first one is this coming Monday. Uh, and uh, please do uh, RSVP uh, to our friends at kidsohio.org, Mark Real, where's Mark, you all know Mark, Mark and his colleagues, I see Erica here, and I thought I saw Ann somewhere, are helping us organize uh, these, uh, these events. Um, so uh, please help, help, them, uh, help them help us uh, by letting us know who's, uh, who's going to come to these, uh, and, uh, uh, these events. Uh, we also uh, continue to try to make opportunities available to you. Uh, I was really excited. About a third of the commission was able to meet Sebastian Thrun uh, last week. I think those who were there uh, were really energized. 
uh, by the opportunity. I know it came late, and so you weren't all able to, uh, to organize your calendars. Thank you for those who did come. Uh, and you'll see at lunchtime today that we'll be interacting with uh, Clarissa Shen from, um, from Udacity, uh, a little bit more about uh, Sebastian, who's been uh, making uh, national news. Uh, George, uh, somebody told me that it's actually, there's an article today, I think, about uh, Sebastian and Governor Kasich are together in Davos uh, and uh, talking about collaborations uh, in the state of Ohio. So it's, uh, it's terrific. Um, and uh, uh, many of you will be uh, participating, uh, thanks to uh, the good offices of United Way uh, in, uh, in Jeffrey Canada's presentation uh, here in uh, Columbus. We all look forward to that. Uh, just finally, uh, uh, say a word about today. Uh, uh, I think the good news is, you know, the fact that it takes 20 minutes to give you an update on everything we've done to date, and this is only our second substantive uh, meeting, uh, is, uh, is really a reflection of how much work is going on um, and how much uh, we're doing as a commission. So I thank you for all the support you've uh, made possible for us to get moving so quickly on so many fronts. Um, today, uh, we're, going to, uh, we're going to take up two very important questions. The first uh, is uh, what we've been calling uh, defining success. Um, and uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, we, uh, I've had a number of you come up to me over the course of the first meeting and say, well, you know, how do we know what we want to accomplish? <laughs> and I said, uh, you know, hold that question uh, because I felt uh, important that we at least get a little bit of uh, meat under our belt before we tackle the question of how do we know. But now that you've had that, uh, uh, that taste, it is time to ask the question. Um, and uh, uh, we're going to be able to hear from experts this morning who look at this question in different ways. Uh, 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 Dr. Wise, who's here, the superintendent of the Southwestern City Schools. This is the sixth largest school district in Ohio, contiguous to Columbus. Um, and he's going to share with us a, a, a very highly regarded superintendent in a very highly regarded district, share with us how they think about uh, uh, success, uh, how they measure it. Uh, Greg Brown, uh, many of you know the Graham family of schools is among the longest uh, serving charter schools uh, in our community. They think about it. Uh, a little differently. Um, uh, Amy Kennedy, the principal of the Metro School, thinks about this question a little differently. And then uh, Battelle for Kids, as you remember from your first notebook of materials, uh, did an international study of how do the best performing countries think about success. Uh, and Brad will uh, share with us uh, some of those uh, issues. Uh, I mentioned in my memo to you yesterday, which is also in your notebook, uh, interestingly, uh, I think you'll, you'll hear that they all view the official state standards as a minimum, not as how they really view success. So the question uh, they all ask is, what is important to them? How do they see their educational values and priorities? And we're going to have that conversation uh, this morning. Uh, I also wanted to note that uh, a yet another perspective on success uh, is uh, the book that we uh, purchased for you this week, uh, which I uh, invite you to read it at your, uh, at your leisure. This is uh, one of the, the uh, books that is making the waves in education today, so you're very current uh, in, uh, uh, in this conversation. And it takes uh, yet another perspective on this very important question uh, of how children succeed. And our speakers might well comment on, uh, on Paul Tuff's book because I'm sure they're familiar with it. Um, at lunch today, we're, we're, we're then going to switch our, our attention to, uh, to the second topic of the day, which is the, this growing uh, availability of innovative technology uh, to improve teaching and learning. Um, and at lunch, uh, we'll start uh, by showing you how uh, what Udacity does is already being integrated into uh, learning here in our community. So Marcy Raymond, uh, uh, who runs the uh, technology programs, uh, innovative technology programs at the Reynoldsburg schools, the East M Academy at Reynoldsburg, uh, and Amy Kennedy from Metro, we're actually gonna be joined by some of their students, uh, and they're gonna show us how they're using uh, these online courses to expand the, the scope and, and, and offering. So, uh, so, for one, so, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll be able to see a lesson in progress, if you will, uh, at, uh, at lunchtime. Uh, and, then, uh, and then we'll hear from uh, truly the nation's leading expert on this subject, Tom Vanderark. Uh, Tom, uh, I've, I've shared with you before, was the first 
He's a former school superintendent, but was also the first uh, education lead at the Gates Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, gave hundreds of millions of dollars of grants, uh, and uh, after left that position, and knows Ohio quite well, after he left that position, uh, he has devoted his professional uh, uh, work to expanding the use of technology and leveraging new technology. So we're really the foremost national expert. Uh, and then the, uh, the immediate question that comes up, and it already did at the last meeting, when we talk about expanding technology uh, is, uh, oh, I think at the lunch with uh, uh, Sebastian Thrun, the question immediately came up, well, what about the digital divide, right? Do we have access to the, to the uh, broadband and, uh, and the devices? And so we'll have experts in our local community that will not uh, sugarcoat the story, but will give us some facts that we can use uh, to, uh, uh, to address it. Uh, and I just note to you, uh, remember one of the things we learned is that uh, this is not just a theoretical uh, issue for us. Ohio's already moving towards online assessments. In the next couple of years, all the testing that we're used to doing uh, by paper is going to be moving online. So we've got to get on, <laughs> if we're moving our assessments online, we've got to get uh, on, board, uh, on board with this. And the field testing of this uh, also uh, actually begins uh, uh, in the spring. I wanted to uh, also point out that you had in your materials, a survey that the Columbus Education Association uh, did of their teachers uh, about technology utilization. Thank you, Rhonda, for, uh, for bringing that to our attention. And the number one conclusion of that, uh, of that survey uh, that's in your materials uh, is, this, uh, is this point, uh, that, uh, that the teachers overwhelmingly uh, said that the technology problems they've experienced uh, so this is not just about the potential of technology, it's a, also about uh, how, do we, uh, how do we realize uh, the technology. Uh, and I'll finally, as I turn it back to you, Mr. Chairman, uh, say uh, you, uh, I, I copied for you in the notebook the memo I sent you by email yesterday. Um, and uh, uh, and I, I realized uh, through some very uh, generous feedback from members of the commission uh, that my jokes about doing our homework were probably taken more literally than I had, uh, than, than I had uh, meant them to be. Um, and uh, uh, rather than try to cull through for you that which we think is the most important in the current literature, uh, we thought that you would like to have your own reference library of the current literature and make your own choices uh, about uh, what is important for you to uh, spend your time on. Uh, but we're not uh, trying to make everybody an expert on everything that's happening uh, in, uh, in uh, education today. Uh, really, quite to the contrary. You're on this commission because the mayor and the council president and all of us in the community feel that you bring your expertise um, to the table. And we know you have something significant to contribute in your area of expertise. So uh, if, if we've inadvertently left the impression, if I've inadvertently left the impression that we're trying to make you uh, 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 the leading national experts on every subject of education, uh, please, uh, my apologies, quite to the contrary. We want you to know what's out there uh, and to have access to the materials. But we're really looking for your contributions in your areas. And that's why, again, we thank uh, Rhonda for providing us with that material this week that we circulated, and I invite and welcome any materials that you would like to circulate. That uh, Mr. Spinning's given me some materials when we get to the subject of, of health that we'll be, uh, that we'll be distributing, um, and we welcome that uh, from others as well. Mr. Chairman, that's my report. All right, thank you, Eric. So uh, before we, uh, <coughs> how's that, a little better? Before we get out to the panel, I just wanted to make a few comments. First of all, Eric, um, Again, all of us have probably teased Eric a little bit about the volume of material. But I would say, um, honestly, it really is helpful for those of us that are not steeped in this to be able to sort of get a little bit of grounding um, is really helpful. Um, by the way, just a thought in this book, for those of you who have not read it, I actually have made my management team or asked them to read this. Because it's, it, to me, it wasn't really about how children succeed. <laughs> it's an interesting observation about about how, how people succeed. So um, it's really provocative, very interesting, and, and so I'd encourage all of you to, to, get, to read it. Um, I, I thought I'd do two things really quickly, and then we'll get on to our panel. I want to just say something. Eric mentioned the, the, um, the recommendation from last week. And I, I get the microphone, so I'm just going to edit. If I could editorialize just for a moment, I think it's, it's important, at least um, for those of us who are, who are, who are uh, involved in this endeavor. Um, 
Obviously, there has been uh, during the past week some some back and forth since we last met related to our our, our recommendation about this independent management review. And to me, this is such an incredibly important thing that we're doing. Um, all of us bring different experiences and insights and perspectives to this work, and that can make it very charged. And it's not just those sitting at the table in the commission; it's all the stakeholders in the community. And one of the things that I think is so important for us is to assume positive intent of those who are engaged. I wish that was happening more uh, in our nation's capital. Um, our ability to do things and get them done is facilitated when we assume that those that we're working with and talking with really don't have some hidden agenda and we're working on it. So I'll say this, I um, applaud and thank the commission and the school board, Carol, for getting us to the right place on that, on that decision. And I think it's really important if we're gonna con continue to push and push decisively um, and with speed, which I think is important because it keeps the energy and the urgency, I think the more we keep that positive um, expectation about, <coughs> about all of us, as much as we may disagree, um, that, will be, that will be serving us very well and I think serving the community well. So thank, thanks to, to, the, to the school board and to this group for, for getting to the right place in that one. Um, on today's subject, um, this issue of defining success is so tricky. Um, the, the whole, I don't think there's a lot of debate anymore about measurement, is it important to measure? I think many people agree um, that you sort of get what you measure. And in fact, if you measure the wrong things, you can get some really bad outcomes. And we've probably seen that in education in some places. Um, that doesn't mean it's not important to measure. So what we need to do in the art and the challenge, and they're gonna be experts far more knowledgeable than uh, me and probably many of us, um, is to really wrestle through those issues of what are the kinds of things we should measure, what does success look like? So I'm hoping that today is really a chance to, to do that, to hear some of those perspectives from people that really are knowledgeable. Um, and again, we'll probably have different perspectives, but again, to me, incredibly important, for, for certainly for the work that I do with my organization, and I know for all of you that work in different kinds of organizations, this goal setting, what do we want to be, what do we want to look like, how do we measure it along the way, really defines how you perform. So um, this is a great opportunity for, for us to do that. So with that, um, probably, long-winded speech. I will uh, again thank Eric for getting us started. Um, thank all of you for your work. And uh, what I'd love to do um, is introduce Stephanie Hightower who is going to assemble this wonderful panel for us. Um, so Stephanie, if you'd like to get us started, that'd be terrific. Sure. And um, I guess I'm just going to invite our panelists uh, to head towards uh, the front of the room. Uh, thank you, uh, George, and thank you to um, Madam Co-Chair for the opportunity and um, Chancellor Finkerhut uh, for allowing me to um, basically moderate uh, this discussion this morning. Uh, as you probably saw uh, in my perspective uh, that was posted on the website, I am definitely, based upon my sports background, um, a believer in uh, high performance and high achievement. And I do truly believe that all children have that ability to achieve high performance, uh, no matter what their backgrounds, uh, no matter what their demographics, no matter what their skin color. And so this was um, a very important um, topic for me uh, to be a part of today, so just want to say thank you for that. So we have some experts here today uh, that we're going to hear from, uh, some accomplished individuals, um, educators here um, locally who we wanted to hear from and to get some perspective as it relates to this whole issue of how we measure a success. And so what I thought I'd do, um, Janet, is to copy you this morning and start off with a quote that I thought was apropos for this discussion. And it was interesting based upon uh, what we heard from our uh, community focus group panelists who were, um, we just heard from, and Kathleen Murphy and I were having this conversation uh, before we started. 
you know, we've got to begin to get people to start thinking differently. And one of the things, you know, as a politician, all of us politicians in the room, you have a slogan <laughs> when you're campaigning. And uh, mine was during the time, you know, you can't keep doing the same old things and expect to get different results. You remember that, Rhonda? I know you heard me say that a bunch of times. And so one that I thought was also, which is also another um, Albert Einstein quote, was we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. We cannot solve our problems with the same th thinking we used when we created them. And so, um, uh, um, Chancellor Fingerhut, please know that I did do my homework. <laughs> um, I did follow instructions. I'm not going to say that I completed all of my homework. Um, but I did have an opportunity to watch the YouTube lecture um, by the thought leader, uh, Tony Wagner. Did any of you have an opportunity to watch that one? Um, and it was at the Harvard School of Education, and um, he wrote the bestseller, Global Achievement Gap, Why Even Our Best Schools Don't Teach the New Survival Skills Our Children Need, and What We Can Do About It. And the takeaways that I got from that lecture were uh, the following, that our education system is obsolete, and it needs to be reinvented, not reformed. That was the first one. Second takeaway was the world doesn't care about what you know, but what you can do with what you know. And the most, um, the, the, the one that really stuck out for me, this takeaway, um, was his hypothesis that in order to be competitive in a global knowledge economy, the skills that matter most are critical thinking and problem solving, agility and adaptability, collaboration and cross networks and leading, initiative and entrepreneurship, initiative, I'm sorry, effective oral and written communications, accessing and analyzing information, and curiosity and imagination. So if you too subscribe to this concept that these core competencies must be mastered in order for our children to be successful, then like me, you are probably questioning whether or not our state standards, as Eric pointed out earlier, are high enough to compete successfully in a global economy. So um, what we're going to do, what I'd like to just sort of tee up is let these folks here, these experts, talk a little bit for about five to ten minutes about what they're doing um, in their schools, in their district, and then my assignment with you is for us to have a very um, intellectual and interactive conversation this morning. Um, and so that we can then walk away hopefully with a recommendation that we can then take back to um, the commission um, for follow-up down the road as one of the recommendations for this report. And so why don't we start with you, Amy? Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Amy Kennedy. I'm the principal at the Metro School uh, right on the other side of campus over there. My name is Bill Weiss, superintendent of Southwestern City Schools, and that's the southwestern portion of Franklin County. Uh, we represent about 20,000 students. It's a consolidated district from the 50s. We're urban, suburban, and rural. So we have a little bit of everything. We think we're probably um, a, as good an example of the state overall as any single district in the state. Um, we're about 56% free and reduced. We have uh, 63 languages spoken and one of the highest percentage of non-English speakers of any district in the state. So it's a wonderful place with great opportunities. Brad Mitchell, I'm with Patel for Kids, a nonprofit school improvement group, um, and I've had the pleasure to work with all four of these folks, so I'll be saying the least during the time here. <laughs> uh, Greg Brown with the Graham Family Schools, a group of four charter schools uh, located in Columbus, uh, two high schools, a middle school, and an elementary school. Great, so we're going to start then with Dr. Wise and let you start with your presentation. Great. A little bit about Southwestern. Um, I provided some information to Matt that I believe that you have. Just to kind of put it within context, 2002, when we take a look as a district, um, at that point in, 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 in time, we had a D on the state report card. Um, we had never earned a math indicator in the history of the district, in the history of testing at that point. Um, that was also the first year that uh, building ratings came out. Uh, we only had one building in the entire district that received an A or a B on the state report card. We had six Ds and Fs. Um, we had 32 buildings. Um, since that time, we've made significant improvement. We've gone from 45% of the indicators earned to 77. We've gone from 77% or 77 points to 95 points on the performance index. Our graduation using the old 
methodology, uh, moved from 75 to 88. We went from that one building with an A or a B to now we have 73% of our buildings that are A's and B's. We have no D's and F's left in the district as far as single buildings and that goes. In that same time period, we have had a significant increase in our non-English speakers as well as an increase in our children of poverty. Um, so the one indicator would tell you that things shouldn't be going the right direction, but without question for us, they are. Um, we're very proud of those improvements. And one of the things I want to talk a little bit about is kind of the way we approach that um, to help you understand how we define success. Um, we really believe in focus. And so when we were at a D, we focused on very limited improvement efforts. We were very narrow in what we did. Um, our staff at the time would have told you that our mantra was GAP, graduation, attendance, and proficiency, and that's what we did. Um, we have focused on improving those skills. We, we didn't think we had any credibility to go out and talk about broad scale reform, improvements, adjustments, until at least we could get some level of basics within our student body. We took, it took us about five to six years to get to that point. We've had an A on the state report card as a district for the last three years in a row. Um, we've made those significant improvements. The other piece for us is we created common frameworks. Um, some of you may have seen the work done from Battelle for Kids or others that talks about our mobility. We have a lot of sharing going on. When you take a look as a district, um, we have about 10,700 students on our books that actually have a Columbus address. When you look at a broader perspective, it's probably about 12,000 school age students uh, live within our boundaries. So there are significant numbers there, significant mobility among our schools and with other districts. And so one of the things we found very quickly is that we wanted to create common frameworks to work from. Not necessarily how the teacher implemented them, but common frameworks to work from for the students. And we did that in literacy, specifically mathematics, professional development. We too, and I think you've probably heard to this point, we believe that leadership matters. That principle is a very important role. Those staff members are a very important role in bringing that about. But we believe there had to be some commonalities about that. And the way we approach that, and just who I am as an individual, we approach things from an outlier perspective. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, when you go back to systems thinking, you would expect certain results from the system within given parameters. When there are things that are outside of there, we try our best to eliminate that. If they're overperforming, we find out what they were doing and we integrate those into what we do for, and we share across. If they're underperforming, we find ways to eliminate that issue as well, um, sometimes more aggressively than others. But the end result is we look for outliers in all our data sets. And until we actually reduce that, um, reduce those outliers or eliminate those outliers, that's really our focus. As we do that, we look for disruptive innovation. What are other people outside, other things going on that we can look for that next generation of S-curves, if you follow that literature, and for that next improvement effort. Um, the other component for us, we only spend, when you look at percentage of spending, we're 14th in the county in per pupil expenditure. And when you look at where we put our money, there are only two areas where the percentage is over state average. One of them is classroom instruction. The second area is professional development. We are about twice the state average on professional development. We believe that we will never be able to afford all the resources that our students need, so our teachers are going to have to be the best trained in the world in order to provide that. And so we heavily invest in staff development. We believe in it. We do a lot of job embedded initiatives in order to go through that. So that's kind of set the stage. This is hard for me. My wife says I can't say hello in 10 minutes, so I'm trying to move. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to set the stage for that in, in, in the standpoint. One of the things that Mr. Fingerhut shared a little bit about is some of the focus group work you're doing. As we move through that process, we still had a C rating on the state report card, but it was clear to us that we had eliminated a majority of the outliers. The trajectory of our improvement efforts were going to move us forward to at least a high B or an A on the state report card. At that point, the leadership team said, we need to get rec ready for that next disruptive innovation. It can't be about graduation attendance and proficiency anymore. That's not enough. We now need to move down that next path. We employed uh, uh, individuals from American Electric Power. Um, not employed, they, they provided some resources to us um, through their staff that ran focus groups with our community. They ran those focus groups around six strategic dimensions, academic achievement, student development, and extracurriculars, innovative education, college and career preparation, parent engagement, and diversity. Those were the six areas. They ran them completely outside. There were no school staff invited to or welcome at any of those meetings. They were completely done without us intentionally. We wanted an open dialogue, and we didn't want that filtered in any way, shape, or form. And so through that process, 
Um, long and short of this part is we've engaged about a thousand people throughout our community in these conversations, either through focus groups or through the refining. But they came up with four themes. The four themes were pretty direct. Access for all students to the highest quality educational opportunities. What they said is, it doesn't matter who you are or where you start from, before you leave us, you should have the ability to matriculate to the most rigorous classroom opportunities, the most rigorous classes that we can offer. There's got to be a pathway for kids to get there. Second piece, they told us very clearly through the focus groups that instruction needs, to, they recognized all kids are different and they're not all coming at the same places. And they were willing to accept that and acknowledge that, which we thought was pretty, uh, pretty important. The other part of that, though, is they said, and these are their words as they came back to me anyway, it would be discriminatory and inappropriate to lower expectations as a result of recognizing they're not all the same when they come to you. Lowering expectations when they're all going to have to compete in the same world is simply inappropriate, and it's discriminatory. And so they were very clear that, that, was, that, that lowering expectations was not an option. We had to get them there by the end. The third piece talked about seamless and universal access. It's a, it's a long one, to instructional enhancement. You also should have this document. Um, instructional enhancement, remedial learning opportunities through the integration of technology and other forms of communication. Give you just two examples. If you ever had to go back to the middle school at 10 o'clock at night and knock on doors trying to get your students' homework that they left in their locker. Shouldn't have to happen in today's world with today's technologies. That should be PDF, that should be on the web, the kids should be able to download it at home. If you run out of inter print, printer cartridges, you should be able to email it back to the teacher. You shouldn't have to make that midnight staples run. That just doesn't make sense in today's world. A parent shouldn't have to have six different passwords and four different interfaces to work through in order to find out how, whether their kid's lunch date or lunch account's up to date or whether this teacher's using this. They wanted it seamless. As one mom explained to us, she said, look, I'm in a tough situation. I've got shared parenting. Dad has the child during the week. I have the child on the weekend. So, or vice versa, I'm sorry. Dad has the child on the weekend. Dad picks the child up from school on Friday. Friday folder goes home from the teacher. Guess what never comes back from Dad's house? The Friday folder. Well, guess who's getting yelled at and who can't help on the homework throughout the week? Me, because I don't know what's going on. Why isn't that delivered electronically in a mass email? Those are the types of things they were talking about with the ability for 24-7 seamless access. And then the last one that came out as a theme is they recognize that, that we will never have the resources to be everything to everybody, but they also said that public education, specifically Southwestern in our area, you're in a unique position to convene groups and communicate. We know you can't offer drug and alcohol counseling for families. You won't have the resources to do that. But you know what? You should be in a position that you can actually refer to three or four different resources within the community that could be of assistance. We don't need you to deliver the service. We need you to at least recognize there's a problem and link it. So from there, we created a balanced scorecard. I won't go through the dynamics of that. Many of you are probably familiar with that format. That's also been provided to you. Then for us, the last step of that was to create five bold goals. Um, the five gold, bold goals support the balanced scorecard approach, and they're the overall district measure. Um, very quickly, students can enter college without remediation. Parents are active in, in the communication process. Students graduate on time. Students exit emotionally, physically, and emotionally prepared for the world which they'll enter. And families are vested, truly vested and engaged in the planning process for where their child is. Many times you've heard of a four-year plan. How many high schools continue their four-year plan beyond high school? Why isn't it rolling? So that as, you as, as you're a sophomore, you know the entrance requirements for the college you're looking at. You know the prerequisite classes. Many of those four-year plans just stop at graduation. It's not seen as a rolling, continuing component. We want parents engaged in that process so they know what the costs of higher education are. They know what the prerequisites are. They know what the grants are. They can define what FAFSA is all about. Whatever the cases are, they need those components. So the long and short of those conversations are those are the bold goals that have driven us forward. What I wanted you to hear in that conversation is we've moved from basic skills with GAP to now we believe it's about educating children for the real world and it's a much broader context. Thank you, Dr. Doc, Wise. Dr. Wise, could, yes. I don't know if we do no, Q&A. This now. is interactive. Um, could you comment on the role of the school building and the principal in your district and uh, decision making and setting the uh, the agenda? Absolutely. Um, we expect 
that all continuous improvement planning, and that's what we're about. How do we measure student success? It's about building improvement. We want to see that continue to move forward. Each of our buildings has, and each of our principals have a great deal of latitude. It does need to align to the ideas that I just expressed to you. But what they measure, how they measure, how those components are done and delivered, that's up to them. Um, we support, we foster. One of the things we've done over the last several years is we've eliminated 400 positions. 62 of those positions were actually between the superintendent's office and the principal. We've eliminated that layer. We don't have that. We're there now to support them. We've eliminated those components. So, so you have what I might characterize as a decentralized administrative approach. What we believe is the only time that you centralize is when you pick up effectiveness or efficiency. And we want the power and authority left at the building level to make the decisions in the best interest of children because we believe that the, stat, the principals and the teachers know the children best. All right, so thank you, Dr. Wise, who just presented from a traditional school perspective on how they measure success. We'll now move to uh, Greg Brown, um, and who uh, is focused on charter school and experiential learning. And uh, so we'll turn it over to you, Greg. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. Um, and I want to thank uh, everybody here for their interest in not just experiential education, um, although I do appreciate that chance to share this with you, but also uh, being part of this panel, I, I know that you're all interested in the success of our city and education in particular, uh, but I also know you're learning a lot of new um, matters that regard education, and it's not always easy for uh, adults to uh, be ongoing learners, um, but I think it's wonderful as a as a model for uh, kids because it is difficult to learn, but um, I, I think we're all going to be better off because of this work you're doing, so thank you. Uh, the Graham Family Schools is a group of four public charter schools uh, in Columbus. We're known as a mom and pop organization um, in the charter lingo. I'm pop. Uh, <laughs> Mom is my colleague, uh, Eileen Mears, and she and I, along with the rest of our staff, uh, started each of our schools. The first one, the Graham School, uh, was started in 2000, and its focus is experiential education, uh, and that is played out through uh, community service that our students conduct every Tuesday and Thursday in the community with about 100 partners. Um, the Charles School at Ohio Dominican University is an early college high school. There are three official early college high schools in Franklin County, and Amy's school, Metro, is one, and she's going to talk to you about that later. Uh, Afrocentric uh, with uh, Columbus uh, schools and with Columbus State is the other, and then our school with Ohio Dominican University. And the focus of the early college program, which is a national program, a couple hundred schools around the country, uh, initiated with funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation through an organization called Jobs for the Future, um, is to broaden uh, the uh, number of people who have access to higher ed, A, and to prepare students in a way that they are more likely to succeed in, um, in college once they get there. You've talked about remediation as a scourge. I know over 40% um, of college student, freshmen in Ohio have to be remediated. It's higher at, uh, at Columbus State and other community <coughs> colleges, and it's something that, as a community, we all need to address. Um, we uh, started the Jim School, uh, Graham Expeditionary Middle School, uh, a few years ago uh, as a way to help um, really create an articulation between our high schools and middle school. Um, we were in that school about a month and we realized we needed to start an elementary school. So the Grand Primary School uh, began uh, really as a way for us to have a K-12, K-14 uh, continuum that we could study these articulation points to, well, to teach our children, of course but to secondarily to study the articulation points between uh, P and K, 5 and 6, grades 8 and 9, and then 12, 13, and college and work, and to know how to communicate uh, with 
with uh, the <coughs> teachers at those grades so that we could have our own students better prepared. Um, the Graham School was started, and you mentioned Tony Wagner. Tony Wagner did a study uh, at Harvard uh, about 15 years ago in which he was examining um, high schools in America. And roughly, he, he found that about 25% of high school students found high school to be an extremely meaningful experience. Another 25% were absolutely shut out of the experience. And then there was this 50% in the middle for whom high school was anywhere from a drag to irrelevant to um, not particularly meaningful. And that was one of the uh, motivations for us with the Graham School. Um, we felt that that senior year can be such a waste uh, for so many kids. Um, and we uh, wanted to have the Graham School be a, a way for students to prepare for this gap in preparation for adulthood. Uh, so, yes, preparation for work. Yes, preparation for, um, for college. Uh, but also preparation for adult life that requires, um, you know, a lot of what we call now the soft skills, but uh, the, the things that are just so important in, in our um, success as adults. And then uh, you have the Paul Tuff book at your table, which I also feel is just a wonderful uh, text, and we're using it for all of our administrative team as well. One thing that he... Uh, it discerns is at the at the end of the book he, he really points to motivation as the key conundrum for helping students succeed. How do we fire up students to become motivated about their own desire to learn and this this uh, element of motivation of finding what it is that motivates a person, especially you know we all understand that teens sometimes uh, find pride in saying that they don't care about anything. And their parents will ask them, you know, what did you do today? Nothing. Um, and, but we also know that they actually are desperate for meaning in their lives, and as we all are. And they are desperate to connect with other adults in addition to their parents, in addition to their teachers. Um, not in spite of their parents, but, uh, but in addition. And so the, the Graham School was started as a way for us to help connect teens to um, adults widely in the community. Um, the Charles School was started as a way to address the gap in who it is that goes to college, in who it is that succeeds at college. And by the way, the cohort who we have targeted, which are kids of poverty and first generation college goers, that cohort actually drops out of college at a higher rate than they drop out of high school. So they get into college, but success at college becomes uh, very challenging for them. And part of it is because that the, the rigor at their high school was not significant enough, maybe. Um, but it also has to do with, uh, college is daunting for anybody. And if you expect to uh, go to college your uh, whole life and your parents have gone to college, um, it still is dawning when you first get there because you, uh, you, you have management issues of yourself, you have a uh, quicker turnaround of assignments, just a lot of things. But uh, for kids for whom nobody in their family has been to college, doesn't know how to support this, it's an even more uh, challenging experience for them. So what the early colleges do is to provide this kind of nurturing support through the first couple of years of college. Our students can graduate with up to an associate's degree from Ohio Dominican. Um, they uh, all have had some uh, college experience, and this is true for all of our uh, early colleges around the country. And we saw this as, as, a, as an issue, again, of uh, meaning for teens and their lives. Um, the uh, GEM School, Graham Expeditionary Middle School, and GPS, Graham Primary School, are affiliated with the Expeditionary Learning Schools, which is a national organization that uh, uses the resources of the community to uh, bring together 
those uh, in um, collaboration with uh, the academic mission of a school to um, deepen the understanding of students for uh, a, a subject area, um, but also for how you learn, that we learn through using multiple sources um, and uh, on deeper subjects. So we create what we call expeditions, and our first expedition for our sixth graders is on the Underground Railroad. It happens to, Columbus happens to be, uh, have a lot of local uh, connection to the, <coughs> excuse me, to the Underground Railroad, and so we use the, the resources that are here, uh, both through, um, through the Ohio Historical Society, uh, in Cincinnati, the Freedom Center uh, that our students visit, um, and literature that we read, and deepen the understanding of our kids about the, that experience for many people. Um, in seventh grade, our first uh, expedition is on our global world. And uh, it, uh, in particular, uh, we had a teacher who was in the Peace Corps in Cape Verde in West Africa, which was also uh, very involved in the slave trade. And so widening the understanding for our kids about that experience, and then widening the uh, understanding about um, risk and leaving home. And we partner with uh, a Columbus school, uh, the Columbus Global Academy, uh, and uh, through a pen pal uh, experience, our students are learning about what today's kids who have to leave their home, what they experience, and then they produce a book uh, about that. Um, so the, the expeditions really rivet attention around, around uh, a single topic that deepens their, their learning. Our elementary students are doing the same. And, uh, you know, briefly, you have, uh, I think, a, a folder at your table about what it is that, that we do, so I'm not going to get into all of that, but I would invite you to read that, visit our school. In fact, I think that you are going to be visiting our school in March. Um, but uh, expeditionary learning is briefly um, a learning by doing and then reflecting on that uh, with... And, you know, kids have too many experiences, frankly. We all do. And, and, but how do you make sense of them in a way that is, is a learning experience? And so through guided uh, uh, study and through guided experiences and then reflecting on what you've done through uh, dialogue and writing, both with teachers and others, you start to make connections to the, um, to the wider world. I want to read you a, a, just a brief email that a kindergarten teacher sent around today to us, one of our kindergarten teachers. And this was uh, an insight that she was so thrilled to encounter with one of her students that she wanted to share it with you know, a wider audience. She, she writes, <clears throat> in crew, that's what we call advisory. We call it crew because we want them, they're more than just passengers, you know, they're part of the, the design of the ship. In Crew, we read the book, Naked Mole Rat Gets Dressed. If you're not familiar, Naked Mole Rat likes to wear clothes, but the other naked mole rats make fun of him. He keeps doing it anyway, because he likes it. We use this to talk about having courage. Others may not agree with what we do, but we can still do it anyway if we like. Macarius raised his hand and said, that's just like the book you read last week. I said, which one? And he said, the one about the man. I finally figured out that he meant Martin's big words. I asked him why, and he said, because in that book, people didn't agree with what Martin was doing, but he did it anyway. If you're not familiar with Martin's big words, it's a story about Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., and is somewhat implicit in its message. I was seriously impressed that he could make this connection, especially to a book I read in class five days ago. So even with five-year-olds, they are able to, as all of you know who have had five-year-olds or encounter them, they can make connections that are beyond our estimation. And so as we uh, design our work, knowing that five-year-olds have this capacity 
as well as 15-year-olds, who sometimes try to shut it off, um, we, we realize that you know, having this opportunity for them to help design their own work is so important. So we talk about self-direction and connection to community in all of our schools being critically important. We also, uh, just to, uh, to end here, believe very strongly in partnering. And so our partnering uh, with 100 partners at the Graham School, with Ohio Dominican uh, and Middle College National Consortium, uh, which is our national partner, uh, and with EL helps us to leverage resources. And I think that as we move forward with how we might um, arrange our education dollars, <coughs> We need to be th thoughtful about how we can leverage them. So when I talk about leveraging, at Ohio Dominican, they give us the uh, PSEO rate, which is the, the rate that Columbus State and other community colleges charge to high school students. It's about a fourth of what their tuition is. We then take the state per pupil dollars to help pay for that. So we are all leveraging dollars there to have our students be educated up to an associate's degree. Two years of college, it's up to perhaps $50,000 that uh, our students can, can earn. Um, with the Graham School, we're leveraging the partnerships we have with community members to help our students be prepared for adulthood and work uh, when they leave our school. So I think that um, that, that is where I'm going to stop and um, thank you again. Thank you, Greg. All right, so now we're going to take it up another notch, a little more radical in nature. Uh, would you describe it as that, I Amy? Would. Yes, ma'am. And talk about e-STEM learning as well as mastery and how that, how she measures success. Amy. That's right. Good morning, everyone. So. Um, as I mentioned in my brief introduction, I'm the principal of the Metro School. So the Metro School is a school that's actually located on West Campus of The Ohio State University. Um, we are a STEM school, and as Greg mentioned, we're an early college. And so uh, there are a lot of things that we do at Metro that are atypical for a high school, in, not only in the state of Ohio, but really across the country. Uh, today I'm going to specifically talk to you about how we assess students. Uh, we use a system called Mastery Learning. I sent you some homework to read about it, so hopefully uh, that was engaging for you all. But I want to just uh, introduce that the notion that we're a STEM school does not mean only that we teach science, technology, engineering, and math. We are well aware that is the most commonly accepted acronym for STEM. But if we think about that, if all it took to be considered a STEM school is to teach classes that are in science, in math, and to use technology, every school in the United States would probably be considered a STEM school. So for us, it's much more about our habits of heart and mind, which you see up here behind you. And it's interesting uh, that they actually mirror some of the work in the Tony Wagner book. Uh, again, these are not necessarily uh, groundbreaking ideas that students should be engaged in their learning, that they should demonstrate critical thinking, that they should be active and responsible decision making. But what we've done is really taken these habits and we've codified them and we use them. So you'll actually see some of my students this afternoon during lunch. So I encourage you, if you get a minute, to just ask them about the Metro habits. They should be able to talk to you about them. I haven't prepped them for that in advance, so this will be a little uh, formative assessment to see if they know what they should know. But uh, these habits are really the work that drive what we do in class every day. So for us, every single class in the school is a STEM class. Art is a STEM class, wellness is a STEM class, English is a STEM class, because they all ask students to use a sense of inquiry, to use some critical thinking, to work together, to communicate about what they know. Um, we are a completely inclusive STEM school, so what that means is that it's a complete lottery if you get into Metro or not. Half of our students come from the Columbus City School District and half come from the suburban districts. Um, about a third of our students are eligible for free and reduced lunch. Uh, this year we have 10% of our students who are identified with a special need. That's actually a little lower for us. We've been as high as 15 or 16%. Um, I don't know why it's a little lower except the complete blank lottery, uh, blind lottery process that we use to have students come. Um, 
I'm gonna, I put this slide in here about our accountability just so that you guys can see how we're performing against other schools on the Ohio graduation test. This is not our goal. The next slide actually uh, is, shows that our ACT measure, which is what my goal is for our school and for our students. But you can see that we're performing right along with some of the higher, you know, traditionally higher performing schools in the Franklin County area. Um, and we, we particularly are proud of this number because we're a completely inclusive environment. So it doesn't matter if you come to us reading at the third grade level. It doesn't matter if you can solve a single step equation. It doesn't matter if you don't know your math facts. We're gonna get you where you are. We're gonna hold you to a really high standard, but we're gonna help you get there. This is really um, more of a driver for us in terms of being a results-oriented or data-based organization. Our ACT average it, last year was 24.5. The state of Ohio's average was 21.8. My personal goal is that we, I would love if we could be the highest performing high school in the county with uh, the best ACT score. Because even though what you'll see, you know, when you talk to my kids this afternoon, when you guys come and visit Metro, you'll see we do a lot of projects. And we do a lot of um, non-traditional kinds of assessment. But we combine that with very traditional kinds of assessment because the bottom line is, we can be as innovative as we want in educating our kids, but the world of post-secondary education is still gonna require a certain test score on an ACT or an SAT. So we feel that we would be doing kids a disservice if we sent them off into the world excellent communicators and uh, collaborators, but they couldn't decode a multiple choice question under some, <coughs> some time constraints. So we kind of have this, we certainly have a robust portfolio of assessment. Uh, for three years in a row, 100% of our students have graduated from high school. They've all been accepted into college. And a number that's pretty meaningful to us is that 85% of our students actually take a college class before they graduate from high school. So what that means is for 85% of our students, the overwhelming majority, they did not need four years to graduate from high school. And what makes this even more impressive is that in order for students to get their high school credit, they have to get an A. They have to get a 90% in order to move on. What that means is that time is really flexible, but performance is absolutely not. And that's the opposite of what happens in a traditional school. So usually what happens is the model that's on my left and your left, awesome. So you see that uh, students come in, they sit for the same amount of time, but their level of performance is different. We see this, at the end of the year you get a grade. You move on to the next class. Whether you got an A in Algebra 1 or a D in Algebra 1, you're moving on to the next math class. For us that doesn't make very much sense because if you haven't really mastered the skills in Algebra 1, how do we ever expect you to do anything better than the previous grade you got in the class in the next class that requires mastery of the content from the first class? So it just sort of creates this system where students are being pushed on to the next class and they're not being successful and we look at them when they're seniors and they're scoring a not very good ACT score and they have a not great cumulative GPA and we think, well, why, you know, why didn't you work harder? Well, you didn't work harder because you didn't have the skills. You didn't even know what you were supposed to be doing before we moved you on to the next class. So what you see at the bottom of this slide is this, um, it's our master schedule for the year. And you can see we've built a system that allows students to earn as many as nine high school credits a year. So most systems allow students to earn five, six, seven high school credits a year. So this model <coughs> provides an opportunity for acceleration. It also provides an opportunity for remediation and recovery in the same system. So in the first year one student schedule up there, you see that students can earn as many as nine credits. Now, not every student is going to earn nine credits, but some students are going to earn nine credits. And so at the end of two years, you all can do the math, they've earned 18 credits, actually 18.5, because we have an advisory system in there that's uh, flexible in there for some credit. But we have students at the end of two years who are pretty much done with the minimum high school graduation requirements. And so those are the students that start to access college coursework right here on this campus. Now the students who are not pretty much done with high school at the end of two years still have 18 more opportunities to earn the 21 credits that they need to graduate 
And we've built in a system that has flexible entry and exit points. So we're not all starting a class in August and finishing it in June, and that's the only time you can start and stop the class. That doesn't really make sense to us. If we know you don't know the first part of the material, you should stop and revisit that material. This is what it looks like when kids start to earn, uh, start to access college. You can see, like Greg was uh, talking about, sort of a, a cushioned, soft, supported entrance into college. What, in the best case, you know, students have earned 18 credits. Here, they have two more high school classes, and they start to take one college class. And then, in the best of worlds, they do awesome in the college class. So we put them in two college classes the next term, et cetera, et cetera. But what might happen is a student might be really uh, accelerating pretty quickly at math, but maybe not in English or maybe not in science. But the flexibility of our system and our belief that we should let you accelerate as much as you can in the content that you know and we should support you when you don't know, what, what can happen is we could have a student taking college calculus but recovering English 10 at Metro. So the system is flexible. Um, I've got a lot of autonomy in my building to make those decisions. Um, when we think about mastery and you know why it's important, why do we use mastery, why do we make kids get an A, it's important because it changes the student's efficacy about their own learning. I can't tell you how many times, when we used to recruit, we used to say, everyone gets an A, you know, you, you earn an A before you get your credit. And we found that for students, that could be a little disturbing. Students who are thinking, I've never earned an A. I can't earn an A. Uh, students would say, are you gonna kick me out if I don't get an A the first time? So we've had to really change our messaging to say, we will work with you until you have mastered the content before we move you on. Uh, another piece that's interesting about mastery is that it takes away this sort of uh, points for behavior uh, system that happens occasionally in a high school classroom, or points for bringing in tissues, or points for doing extra credit, or points for attendance, and it really sort of boils down to show us what you know, show us that you can do it, and we'll work with you on those soft skills about coming on time and working with someone else and sharing what you know. Um, that's really all I need to tell you about Metro. Um, you will, again, meet one of my teachers this afternoon. You'll see some of my students, and then hopefully you guys can make the visit that is scheduled for the end of February. Thank you, Amy. Any questions for Amy before we move on to Brad to talk a lot about it? And I don't know if you all had an opportunity to, again, doing your homework. <laughs> um, this uh, piece was in our books. Uh, the global education study that Patel did, Patel for Kids, and it you know, speaks to when I was talking about the global you know, knowledge economy that Tony Wagner talked about mm -hmm. and what those skill sets are. So uh, would you like to say something? Amy? No, I was... I, I was motioning to tell you to use the microphone, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, and so uh, with that, then uh, we'll have Brad talk a little bit more about this study and its, its, its relevance. It's good to be in your company. Um, like Greg, I appreciate the uh, courage and wisdom and compassion you're showing now and you will show in whole system reinvention. It's a tough task in many ways, I'll still Greg's kindergarten metaphor, in a way you're like naked mole rats, so. And I mean that positively. Um, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm both the cleanup hitter and the lead off hitter. In a way I, I'm cleaning up in terms of kind of common optics here and help setting up this afternoon's conversation about technology and analytics. So I have seven slides in seven minutes. If we can pull up, oh, here we go. What, what, what do I do? Just oh, that right right here. Okay. So when we uh, we visited uh, five uh, places: mm -hmm. Finland, Singapore, Hong Kong, Ontario, and Long Beach, places that for at least the last decade have shown consistent high performance, regardless of changing conditions aspect of it. And our question was: How do the highest performing learning systems across the world achieve these results year after year? First thing I want to say to you is we have the world in our own backyard. Quickly, just want, I mean, each of these are their own countries, but there are remarkable connections between some of these countries we studied and what you heard today. And I don't mean to overly define them, but in general, the Long Beach approach and the Ontario approach is the Southwestern approach. The six bold goals that Southwestern does are the same goals that Long Beach does and the same goals that Ontario does. And so, in a way, we have Long Beach and Ontario right here in Southwestern. 
The metro experience in terms of uh, one thing that, uh, that Amy didn't talk about is how the teachers work in metro. And I would argue in any successful educational learning system, how the teachers work are incredibly important. Um, and in many ways, the metro experience is the Finland experience. The way Finland approaches and supports educator effectiveness and educator autonomy and educator uh, productivity is very similar to what Metro is doing. And finally, if you remember, Greg talked about uh, the Graham School's expeditionary learning. That's Singapore's entire uh, approach. Singapore's main aim is to get people ready for their economy. And so one of the key things they do in their high schools, uh, most of their high schools, is have deep apprenticeship programs. And one of the main metrics they look in their apprenticeship programs is immediate hire and then stay, being in that job for a year after they have left uh, their high schools. They have a 95% <coughs> educate to apprenticeship to hire rate. That matters to them. And it all comes from the expeditionary learning that they start in the, uh, in the first and second grades that they have. So we have the world in our own backyard. Uh, next slide. Uh, you'll, in reading the, uh, uh, oh, I'm doing that. <laughs> Please? <laughs> you never help me. Um, okay. Um, Jeez. I won't go over this. What this essentially gets at is what they do. But I think more importantly, and if you listen to these three fine folks, they were really talking about how mm -hmm. they do it. And that's really important. In, in educational reform and system reinvention, the list of what's are everywhere. <clears throat> How you do this is always contextual and always the most essential thing. So the key thing I want to share is the key thing I learned from the, I went to Ontario as, as uh, my, my assignment. And what I love about Canadians that I visited is they give this wonderful, compassionate condescension toward Americans. Toward Amer <laughs> it's a wonderful Canadian polite condescension. It's very compassionate. So essentially they'll say, uh, race to the top. Uh, no child left behind, good intention, bad execution, bad execution, <laughs> aspect of it. And so in many ways in Canada, and I think in the other places we visited, they have a very different mindset. And I want to highlight three, uh, four aspects of the different mindsets. First, success to them is not an end. It's a journey, not a destination. So standards and assessments are outputs, not outcomes. That's hugely important from their perspectives. That's what Metro does, that's what Southwestern does, that's what the Graham family of schools do. The standards and assessments don't become the end game. They are an output that allow them to get at the real education of children and student success for the long term. They really, all five of those places and all three of these places have that similar mindset, I believe. Secondly, uh, talent and jobs are the end game. I don't know if you've seen a book called The Coming Jobs War by Jim Clifton, uh, the head of Gallup. Uh, but they do a world well-being uh, poll and, uh, for years. And for years, uh, when they asked the world, what's the most important thing in their life? They would say family, they would say love, and whatever. In 2008, and remember what happened in 2008, the poll shifted for the first time. And for the last four years, the global well-being poll of Gallup has said that the world's number one aspiration of a good life is a good job. And then Gallup said, there are three billion people on the planet that are looking for good jobs. There are 1.2 billion good jobs. There's a 1.8 billion job gap aspect of it. And these systems we visited, that's what they focus on. How do you cultivate not educational performance, but talent to create the jobs to win the jobs war? And one of the reasons they do that is look at these places, Hong Kong, Singapore, Finland, Ontario, all do not have a great deal of natural resources. They only succeed if their people succeed. Singapore, Hong Kong, they have no room for coal mines aspect of it. They win if they cultivate their talent. And that's a mindset. That's different from saying getting kids passing tests versus cultivating the talent of the region so the region can grow, which leads to the third thing. They all have a city-state sensibility, which I think is very relevant to Columbus. Uh, in fact, Singapore is one of the last three of the world's sovereign city-states that exist. But Hong Kong was, Ontario, though in many ways the size of Ohio in terms of population and a rural-urban split, in many ways Toronto is a city-state aspect of it. Uh, Long Beach is a city-state in terms of its relationship. But what I mean by city-state is the city education and economic development leaders are one. They act as one. 
Um, they see education and economic development as intricately tied, and they see that their number one job is to grow, keep, and support talent. They also want to attract talent from the outside, like the Silicon Valley factor. But they've learned in the global economy they've got to grow, keep, and support their own talent. And the last thing that Greg and Metro uh, has talked about a bit too, the other way is the city-state sensibility in these places, is they see the city as a classroom. Their kids are out in the city, and that increases the chance that those kids will want to stay in that city and grow that city as they grow their own families and they grow their own careers. And the last thing is, uh, as Mr. Barrett said at the very beginning, while metrics are important, all, four, all five of these places are less metric and more meaning-centric, which means the key thing they look for is how children succeed. And is the educational experience a meaningful experience? Are there real connections between learning and life, learning and livelihood? And they really focus much more on meaning-centric things. Educational success in the United States, in general, that's the roadmap, rightly or wrongly. If you look at Race to the Top, if you look at No Child Left Behind, if you look at Ohio State Report Cards, those are basically the four things that we measure our systems by. Some kind of performance ranking system is often the National Assessment of Educational Progress. It was the major uh, infrastructure behind, behind Race to the Top. Some form of college work readiness, is, as uh, Amy talked about in terms of ACT, graduation rates and achievement gaps. That's the educational model, rightly or wrongly. I'm not here to make a judgment of it. But compared to this mindset, it's a little different. But we've got to play this game, and we've got to win at this game, because these are outputs that matter, but we've got to distinguish them from the outcomes that really matter which is talent, growth, whole person, lives that are worthwhile. So in a way, even though it's titled today's conversation defining success, what these other places do and what these three places do, you need to define success, but you need to design success. And designing success is what they're about. And by designing successful conditions, your, your defined success metrics come across. So I just want to hear, uh, highlight quickly eight of them in terms of the optics that these places use. One, they use uh, standards and assessment tests, particularly PISA, to justify their work, not to judge their work. What's striking if you go to these places and go into classrooms, none of these teachers talk about PISA. None of these teachers say, oh, we got the PISA results, and we realigned our curriculum. They don't look at it at all, aspect of it. <coughs> but the leaders of the systems use PISA to justify what they do. So they can continue to get public support, they can continue to get taxpayer support, but they don't use it to judge, they use it to justify. Uh, Bill talked about the same thing in terms of when he was talking about outliers. When they look at their highest performing, their lowest performing things, they do it to justify what they're doing well and spread it, and to justify what they're not doing well and to stop it. But they don't do it to judge. There's a difference between accountability and improvement. And justification improves. Judging tends to reduce that. Second thing they do is they feed and spread empowerment experiences. It's the Tony Wagner aspect of it. If you put teachers and kids in wonderfully rich learning experience, they want more. You'll hear this afternoon from Tom Vanderock that point that if you can spread powerful learning systems as soon as you can, learning is contagious, absolutely contagious. Look at the Khan Academy. Look at the flipped classroom. Flipped classroom, look at that. If you look at the history of educational reform, usually a major pedagogical move takes 10 to 20 years to even catch on in most classrooms. New math, if you remember that. It took 20 years and then we threw it out, aspect of it. If you look in two years, what the flipped classroom phenomena has done in a lot of classroom pedagogy, it's because it feeds and spreads empowering experiences of learning that matter. Third, make learning visible. Learner profile, knowing the learner, understanding it, uh, having evidence about it, and it's multiple measures, not one test measure or a set of test measures, making learning visible. Four, relationships define results, not results defining relationship. In the American experience, I'd argue, results are defining relationships. In the experiences of the places we went to, their relationships define their results. Relationship between higher education and K-12, relationship between teachers and administration, relationships between home and school. All five of the systems we visited, the relationship management was the most important thing they did. I think you heard this today, and I think the Southwestern story is a great aspect of that. Next, feedback amplifies learning. As you probably well know, the, uh, the best study ever done on what interventions make the most difference in student achievement was a meta-study done by John Hattie, in which he looked at 1,000 studies and did a meta-analysis and said the number one key variable that kicks butt over everything else is quality feedback. 
And so the issue here is not just to have the measure, it's what you do with the measure. It's what you do with the evidence of learning that matters. And how prepared and how much capacity do we have as a system to have quality feedback, hugely important. Next, focus on improvement goals and capacity building as compared to focusing on accountability goals and punishment. <coughs> Seven, emphasize <coughs> platforms, not programs. The issue there, you look at the thins. They don't look at an early learning problem or an intervention problem and say, we need a new program. They say, what are the platforms and conditions of success we must create so that all kids can succeed? And then we operate off a platform and not off a program. And then lastly, as, as several people talked about, the interesting thing is when you ask these leaders of these systems, where are you going? They don't go into performance issues. They talk about the real thing for the real world are character, critical thinking, and creativity. And that's the next thing that they want to focus on. Uh, quickly on the Ontario thing, if there, the last two slides, if there's anything I said, I hope you keep the last two slides in mind as you work on your work. Uh, in Ontario, uh, Michael Fullen, one of the main change leaders in education reform around the globe, is one of the key strategists of the Ontario system. He has four great things to look at. When you're looking at a, a success metric or a success initiative, ask yourself these four questions. Does that metric, does that initiative motivate teachers and students? Secondly, does it engage ed educators and students in continuous improvement? Third, does it inspire collaborative action? Fourth, does it affect all students and teachers? If you're a four for four on a metric like that, you've got a good chance it's going to make a difference. Last thing. And to me, I think this is the most important thing. Uh, and I think Tom Van Dark is going to talk a little bit more about this. Right now, I think for the first time in my 35 years of education, we have a Gutenberg moment. Uh, we've always had school improvement. We've always had system transformation. But we've really never had the learning revolution taking place at the same time. And what I mean by a learning revolution is focusing on how people learn and different ways of learning and technology is fundamentally changing the game of the learner revolution. The learning revolution focuses on learner effectiveness, not on teacher effectiveness, not on system effectiveness, on learner effectiveness, on learner access, on personalization of learning. <coughs> the Khan Academy is an example, the flipped classroom is an example of that. At the same time, though, we have teacher evaluation and race to the top and a variety of things that are getting at school improvement to increase teacher and principal effectiveness. And at the same time, we're going after system transformation in terms of changing finance schemes, shared services, a variety of aspects of that. So learner effectiveness, upper circle. Teacher and principal effectiveness, left-hand circle. System productivity, right-hand circle. The last thing I want to show you about the five systems we went to is the five systems don't look like that. The five systems look like a Russian doll. The learner work, the school improvement work, and the system work are all aligned and not working against each other. So if there's anything I could share, it's the capacity as we move forward in whole system renovation to move that Venn diagram so that they overlap. Because what we're happening is how we're having learner revolutions that are disconnected from teacher and principal effectiveness revolutions that are different from system productivity revolutions. That is a recipe for failure. And the five systems we study say the more you can overlap that, the better chance you have of success for all and for making a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. All right, so now we've filled your heads with a lot of information. So I wanted to backtrack a little bit and reset the stage here. We're talking about how we... I'm sorry, is that better? All right, so we're going to reset again so we can refocus and talk about how we design success for our children in the, that live in the Columbus City School District. Yes. So I'm, in, I don't know if we're ready for Q&A. Yes, we are. So I mean, what's jumping through my mind and it's building on this Dr. Mitchell's design for success. So we've got four different perspectives, four examples of excellence. Uh, you're living in our community. You know what our challenges are. You know what this commission's trying to do. You know, what one or two, just running down the line, rapid fire, what one or two things would you say to us um, that you would do if you're in our shoes in terms of recommendations? I would definitely include mastery high expectations for kids, so this built-in remediation and acceleration pattern. But also, I think there's a lot to be said for drawing on the resources of this fantastic community for student internships, making the community your classroom, uh, drawing on the resources that exist to really amplify the work of the school. So, Amiana, I'm curious here, how have you been able to develop a model that has the remediation um, included into the day-to-day -day 
um, uh, work that you do. Sure thing. So uh, if you guys just refer to that, the one slide that shows a couple of examples of our master schedule, you can see that students mm -hmm. essentially take four 90-minute classes a day in a regular semester. And then we have this middle mm -hmm. term. That's a five-week uh, mini-mester, so to speak. So what um, it happens multiple ways, but a couple of systemic ways that should be pretty evident. Um, if a student takes, let's say, English 9, they started it in August, the end of the first semester is in December. At that point in time, students have either earned a credit, they have mastery in the class, they need a little bit of remediation, so they do something called an independent study, which means they're spending time with the teacher outside of the school day, kind of fixing up those one or two areas that they didn't get mastery in, or they might need to actually repeat the class. But what happens is they could repeat the class in our short term, or they could repeat the class in our second semester. All of that is within the same school year. So it might take a student two or three tries to earn mastery in a class. So it takes them an entire year to earn the credit. But the thing is that it's taking everyone else in the state of Ohio, pretty much, an entire year to earn a credit anyway. So we've built in a system that uh, plans for the acceleration but has opportunity for students who need more time or need it in a different way. So, Ms. Kennedy, do you think that doesn't happen in the city of Columbus public schools? I would say that doesn't happen in most public schools. I used to, before I came to work at Metro, I used to teach in Canton City Schools at Canton McKinley. I taught there for a long time. And I came down here and I taught at Metro for a year, and I just couldn't really put my finger on what it was about the culture that happens at Metro and the culture of success and the culture, the student ownership of the school. And I thought about it for about a week and I thought, it is this mastery thing. It is this mastery thing that it's not a game how you get your credit. It's really clear how you get your credit. It's okay if you need to revisit something. And that is the piece that I thought to myself, if I ever go teach anywhere else, I'm gonna, my classroom will be a mastery classroom. So like when I start another school, my school will be a mastery school. Mastery is really important. So Dr. Wise, um, you have an A-rated district, however. So what would you say to um, basically what, what Amy has just shared? I think there are many components to that. The, the idea of mastery learning is, is a fascinating concept. Many of our teachers do that. Kids can retake as often as they'd like. Um, the idea is to have the skill mastered by the end. Working that from a logistical component sometimes becomes a little more difficult, and they've done a great job with that. Um, so when you look at this from that context, I mean, the big pieces for me, um, and hopefully this won't surprise you from this perspective of people will tolerate mandates um, or directives. They will engage challenges. And so as we set the high expectations for this community moving forward, I think it needs to be set in, the, in that tone of high expectations and not mandates. Because people will step to the plate given the opportunity. They will creatively find ways to solve those issues put before them. Um, the, the other component when you look at it from the community standpoint uh, that was shared is this, the concept of 21st century skills, that creativity, that c collaboration, that, uh, that communication, those components, what's that really look like from an end user perspective? Um, I think we're struggling with that in education as a whole, as well as what are those 21st century skills that are beyond the academic components. And I think that's one of those pieces that if we're really truly looking at being a world leader in education here in Central Ohio, would be important for this group to grapple with what does that transfer or what does that mean as we set direction for Columbus Public in the greater Columbus area. Dr. Wise, can I ask a quick question? Well, Mm -hmm. Go ahead. All right. Is that right, Stephanie? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just I wanted to just mention um, both you and um, Amy. You mentioned culture, mm -hmm. so almost like a culture of success. So coming from Southwestern schools, and I'd I'd like to just go back to Metro. How do you develop that culture of success, and how important is that uh, uh, during your journey? There was some work done by Dr. Hoffman um, at one point. He was a Miami professor, and when he looked at proficiency testing in the day, this is a little older, the end result of what he found was 51% of the variability was related to culture. All those things that traditionally argued about class size, which textbook to use, was about 3% of the variability, um, or the variation. So the culture is huge, and it goes back to what Brad shared from the standpoint, it's not about judging. We are where we are today. I would never want to enter a race with Ms. Hightower. 
I mean, I got, I'm not going there. <laughs> I, uh, my chance of running a four minute mile of the day are none. Got it. But the end result is I am where I am. Um, and what we understand is people, people relish success and recognizing where they're at today and the fact that I'm at my eight minute mile. If I'm at 7.30 next week, I'm happy. It's when there's an artificial comparison that makes no sense to me and doesn't compare or doesn't relate to me that people become devalued in that success. The reality is we took everybody from where they're at today. It's not a bad thing. You are where you are, but we're going to get better. So what do we do well? That's one of the questions we answered when we started this um, whole process. One of the questions that was interesting that we started with is what truly could we be the best in the world at? Based on where we're at, who we serve, the resources we have, what could we truly be the best in the world at? We spent a year bantering that question around. Our answer today is we believe we can be the best in the world at taking children from where they are and advancing them farther than anybody else. We believe we're awesome at that. And we think we've got data to support that through value added and other components. And so the fact that we don't look like maybe some of the other suburban districts, that doesn't bother us because we know what we can be good at and we know where we're at and we know we're getting better. So when we develop that culture, we recognize that we're different and it's okay. It's not about assimilation, it's about improvement. Ms. August, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Amy. I think, um, so there are some smaller things that we do at Metro that build a culture and they're not small, they're just pieces of behaviors that we implement. For example, uh, we try to create an office-like environment. So if students need to use the restroom, they use the restroom. If they need to use their phone to call their mom and it's appropriate time, they use their phone to call their mom. If they need a drink of water, they have a drink of water. So we have this culture where we try to treat them like adults and most of the kids act completely fine and there are a few kids who don't and we kind of coach those kids on their behavior. But I think the broader um, thing that we try to do at Metro is win the persistence battle. So if we say we're all going to um, earn an A, for example, uh, we're all going to take a college class, we're going to be kind to each other, we're gonna act appropriately in the hallway, then the adults need to be more persistent than the students in winning that, that battle because it is just a persistence battle. Ms. Augustine. Okay, first I, 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 I do have a question, but I do wanna make sure that I get um, you guys um, input on Alex's question, um, what is your recommendations? Please don't forget that. But um, my question is, uh, how does your different outlooks take into consideration the social economic factors that's influencing the children's experience for, or the children's experience um, it, for education? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I just, I read it, but I don't know what I, does that make sense? Uh, <laughs> I'll try and start an answer on that and then I will take a minute and answer Alex's question as well. Um, we look upon mastery maybe in a slightly different way. Uh, we too are all about mastery um, and, and certainly we have high expectations for the traditional academic subjects. Um, we know that students are not going to be able to succeed at the thing that we ultimately want them to master if they don't have uh, competence at those, at those uh, skills. But we are trying to um, elicit and inspire mastery in uh, what it is that each individual is seeking to become a master in. Um, and it's different for different people. So the, our experiential program is trying to present a number of uh, uh, varied experiences to students so that they can determine that it's something they want to do or something they don't want to do. If a person wants to become a teacher and then goes work and, you know, spends Tuesday and Thursday at a school and finds they don't like work, being around kids, we want them to know that soon. Or if they find out that they love that. Uh, or if they're in a business and discover that they don't really want to be a lawyer or they do want to be a lawyer, that, so uh, we're trying to have um, mastery come from the ground up. And I think when you talk about socioeconomic differences, first of all, we, uh, like I think all of us, would support um, Carol Dweck's notion of a growth mindset and many other people, that intelligence is malleable, 
that we all can grow in intelligence and that we don't accept that just, you know, as Brad was saying, that just because you come to us where you are, uh, it, that that fixes you for, for any length of time. Now, we recognize there can be gaps. We have five-year-olds who come to us and know how to read. We have five-year-olds who come to us and don't know their colors. You know, there are gaps that we have to address. And so we have to individuate. Some of that's related to socioeconomic differences. Some of it isn't. Some of it's related to parents who read to their kids um, and, you know, interact with them. So I think that as far as the socioeconomic, I mean, I, that's, you know, there are a lot of things that can be explanations for where a person is, but th they're not excuses, you know, so we move everybody forward. That's, that's our goal. To briefly um, get at your question, Mr. Fisher, um, I would seek to find a way to leverage our resources. So uh, I think that one of the things we could do is to identify those successful pieces of work both in Columbus schools and in other places and in other settings that we believe are successful and help them partner with schools that perhaps are struggling. Um, and there are plenty of examples of teachers succeeding in Columbus schools, of schools in Columbus that are succeeding that we need to partner with, you know, and the struggle is for a variety of reasons. And this is the same for charters. So, you know, I'm not gonna discount what, what we're doing there. Uh, Dr. Harris has, has initiated a, an effort in this regard. And I think that if we could do one thing here, it would be to, as many of us have said, leverage existing resources and build on what it is that's succeeding. And then also, you know, we're sitting here at Ohio State. They, they happen to have an education college. There are several around this city. And, and what Patel for Kids has done in terms of knowing what is succeeding around the world to bring all these resources together and then uh, to, uh, you know, support their infusion into classrooms throughout the city. Yeah, I'm gonna, I wanna, I've got to jump in because I asked Dr. Gee recently at dinner, what would, what would Lincoln do as a part of his land-grant vision as it relates to this institution in its hometown? Uh, and it doesn't get lost on me that 80% you know, of the professional employees of the district are products of this institution, and so you could mm -hmm. argue, you know, cause and effect, and and I think we've, you know, we've got to put a fine point on it as it relates to uh, our land grant institution to ask the question, what would what would Lincoln uh, aspire us to do? So, Dr. Wise, um, I think it, it would probably be. Um, wise for us to have you also address uh, Ms. Augustine's question because you're not only um, suburban, you're urban and rural um, with the demographics. So maybe you can also give some insights um, to Ms. Augustine. Right. And, and we talk about meeting the child where they're at. We talk a lot about understanding, um, to put this a couple contexts together. First of all, every data point you've read in the papers is basically useless to teachers. It's autopsy data. Mm -hmm. And so that's not what drives their work. We need to understand that that piece is an accountability measure. It, it, it's a confirmation. The work that they do on a daily basis is based on running records. It's based on what the child is, is like as they enter the classroom. It's, it's a, there's a variety of factors that all factor into that. Um, what we do know very clearly is K through about four, three, four, it's about teaching process. Those processes, we don't see huge distinctions. For, there's some language barriers for some of our non-English speakers that slow that process down, but for the rest of the kids, it doesn't. Where we start to experience issues is with the lack of experiences that people bring with them in the context. And that happens about grade five. And you can see a dip in our scores there, partially because the tests aren't equitable that we typically use, but partially because that's where the experience have to play, and you have to have a context. 
When I talk to my child at home and say, give me a three-eighths inch wrench, and they come back with a screwdriver, well, what world is this? From back in the day when we were growing up on our farm, we knew what a three-eighths inch wrench was, and we could tell the difference between a three-eighths and a half. I mean, you, you could feel it. It wasn't even my, my children. They just don't have that same experience. And so for them to be able to problem solve, they have a different set of tools. To more to core to your question is, as we devise instruction, what we have to recognize is what experiential components do we have to build into lessons to supplement that. And that takes significant time. And so all children can, all children will, given the opportunities. But for us, it's about recognizing where they're at and what needs to supplement to make that happen. That, that's really where we focus on that. And we try to provide teachers the tools, whether they be running records, benchmarks, um, lessons on unitizing, subitizing, all those fancy educational terms on how to best make that happen within the context. Um, greatest example I can give you in math, we spend significant times within our amounts of time and problem solving for our younger students just dealing with time and money because it seems to have the best experiential base for the most kids and they can seem to make some sense of that. So, I mean, those are some of the strategies that we address in order to try to address some of those areas where we're not all alike. Brad and then Dr. Harrison. I'm going to try to get at Mr. Fisher's first question, Ms. Augustine's question, and then Mr. Fisher's WWLD, what would Lincoln do? Uh, and all, all three aspects. <laughs> um, three, I think I, <laughs> we could get a wristband. Uh, <laughs> I probably can get Lance Armstrong wristbands for cheap now. Um, anyway. The three answers I would do on, on, uh, on, on, on Mr. Fisher's question, which I think relates, the first answer I think relates to Ms. Augustine's question. You've got to place the learner at the center of the system. Uh, and uh, as I was talking about before, feeding, spreading, and publicizing educationally empowerment experiences is the number one job. Student motivation is going to be the key thing here. We can redesign the system as much as we want for the adults in it. Yeah. But if students aren't motivated to learn and do this, and you know, you're into social media and stuff, I'm just amazed there isn't a student back channel in every district of the world saying, I'm in Mr. Mitchell's class and it sucks. Save me <laughs> aspect of it. The, this part of the learner revolution. And so we've got to look at feeding, spreading, and publicizing educational empowerment experiences. What I mean about dual enrollment, clubs, libraries, summer camps, project-based learning, gaming. We've got to look at all the resources that Columbus has in terms of empowering experiences and turn these kids on. You've heard the story. Kids have to power down before they go into their classrooms. That's right, many classrooms. That's right. So, and I think that's the key SES thing because if you can get to the motivation, deal with stress, like in how children succeed, deal with resilience, and turn on the learner, that's going to be huge. One. Secondly, uh, capacity building, as, as Bill talked about, two times more on professional development and learning. What it's going to take for the educators and the non-educators that work with children in this city state to flip this reinvention you guys are thinking about is a major capacity building effort. And so the second strategy is we'd have to have a clear strategy of how do we build the capacity of not only educators, but parents and everybody that works with children in this learning system called Central Ohio, how do we build capacity? And then the third last thing, the Lincoln answer, is land grant was a place. We live in an age of a platform. And so the land grant's not a place anymore. The land grant promise should be, we will give you access to a platform in which you can learn anytime, anywhere, with anyone for what you need to motivate for and get success. We have the technologies emerging and the systems emerging that land grant is a platform and not a place. And I think education, when it has been place-bound, has its limitations. We are no longer in an age where education is a place-bound and we are limited by our destinies, by our zip code. Platforms over places. Dr. Harrison and then Ms. Perkins. Brad, I, I, th I think I'm right um, when I, I, think I'm like right when I say one of, the, one of the principles of the <coughs> global best practices you all identified um, was college and career readiness, a real emphasis on college, and, or I'm sorry, on uh, work, workforce. Dr. Harrison, we need you to use the microphone. <laughs> You're, Whoa. Getting, you're, you're getting in trouble like me. You just lost two points, Dave. <laughs> I think I'm right um, when I say one of, the, one of the core principles of your glo global best practices was workforce and career readiness. Right. Um, can you talk a little bit about the role employers 
play in that conversation at the places uh, Patel for Kids visited? Sure, and I, I, I'll pick one place. Every place has difference because of culture, but the place I think our team was most impressed by on that point, Dave, was Singapore. And so it's, and it goes back to designing for success. So what Singapore does with its major businesses is it doesn't go to the business at the end of the day and say, could you offer an apprenticeship? Could you do a summer program? Could 12 of our kids come here aspect of it? They actually start off and say, we, they go to the business and they say, what skills, what do you need, and can we design together a pathway, similar to what you guys do at Columbus State all the time, the logistics stuff, all that. They, start, they do that in K-12. They don't wait on that. So the business and education involvement is involved at the design work and not just at the philanthropy work or can you find space for our kid is one thing Singapore does. The second thing Singapore does is its Ministry of Manpower and its Ministry of Education our one ministry aspect of it. And they use data and metrics of looking at where the workforce is, both in terms of skills, job openings, talents, aspect of it, and the leadership and the analytic groups of both uh, groups come together and they say, what's happening where, how do we need to adjust? And they adjust immediately. They don't wait uh, and stuff, because you know as well as I do, if you kind of uh, wait, you're gonna miss the opportunity like we're seeing now with shell play skills and stuff, you gotta move quickly aspect of it. So secondly, they have common planning of manpower planning and educational planning in Singapore is the second thing they do. Then the third thing they do is they hold business accountable. Do you have the jobs at the end of the day? Are they worthy wage? And have you filled your end of the promise? We're just not the pipe going to you. You gotta deliver on your end. So what's interesting is they have this mutual respect, mutual benefit mantra. And I love the phrase aspect of, of uh, you got to be accountable business for not just mm -hmm. holding out the carrot uh, and giving the opportunity. You got to deliver yourself aspect of it. And so the Department of Ministry will, uh, if you look at Singapore's education, economic development, they look for higher education institutions and businesses around the world that they want to say come here, but they vet them through a set of optics of what kind of business do we want, what kind of relationship we want, and it's not necessarily the wild, wild west. Of, of open economic development. It's a very focused economic development. That's Singapore's approach. Thank you. Madam President. Yes. Uh, first off, I'd like to say thank you to you all for your very valuable information. Uh, the work that you all have shared uh, this morning has been remarkable. My question is, is there anything, any idea, any program that you all have done that you would advise don't do. Absolutely. <laughs> this is something... We don't have enough time to come. <laughs> do you know, I think... Uh, I love that you asked that question because I thought you were going to say the other thing, like, is there a program we should get? Here's my deal about programs. They're never as good as uh, a group of thoughtful teachers who had time and space to create something that's designed with a high goal meeting a really high standard but with our kids in mind so uh, the best advice is to create that space and facilitate the work of the people who are the professionals who are in the classrooms every day because they know what's going to engage their kids they know what the standard says and if they have the time and the space and the facilitation they can create something we're in the same piece. The other, the other thing I would share that adds on to that is, and I'll go back to the professional development component, yeah. job embedded, not pull out standalone programs yeah. is what we've seen significant benefit from. We actually have instructional coaches up through grade six that are nothing but literacy and math. They'll go in, they model the lesson, they sit down, they observe the lesson, they provide regular, regular feedback. Those are the components, and they're around their frameworks. I mean, it's not an open-ended type of thing, but those pieces and those needs are what drive it forward, and that has created the greatest amount of efficacy in our, in our, in our staff. They look forward to getting a hold of those coaches. In fact, it's an odd model because I'm always pushed to give us more. I want somebody in there more often to give me feedback, and it's wonderful when they can model, and there truly are experts to do that. That's one of the components from my perspective. I would agree programs aren't very successful overall because they're about one person and one inspiration, but at the end, job embedded is, is a big path for us. A quick, quick answer for me is from, I'd say, go to Ontario. Um, one of the things they do every year in the ministry is they ask the question, what are we going to stop doing? 
and they don't add on the initiative burnout stuff. So they make that actual part of their protocol of decision making. And one of the things a few years ago they stopped doing was in eighth and ninth grade when they saw struggling kids, they stopped doing intensive remedial work and pull out classes and stuff, and they actually accelerated dual enrollment. Again, it gets right back to motivation. They got their eighth and ninth struggling learners involved with community colleges in successful experiences so the kids could see and get accelerated in terms of their motivation and amplification. So they stopped doing a lot of the remedial education work, and they started doing actually acceleration and dual enrollment work. Uh, we, too, have instituted the instructional coaching, and I think that, so I, I guess I'd answer your question by saying that what we didn't do, and we now do, uh, is, is important. And then along with that, and we had that in all of our schools, so K-12, um, uh, what we also do, like uh, Bill, is, is have a lot of professional development. And I think that I was, have been a little bit disappointed with uh, Columbus schools cutting out some of the professional development. Mm. Um, and that we have so much, and we give our teachers so much time to plan. Daily, an hour a day. Weekly, we have a two hour meeting, and we monthly have professional development days. So our teachers are given enormous amounts of time for planning. Ms. Augustine. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. Good. Okay. I'll follow you. Um, what stands out to me is um, you've all said something about collaboration and um, drawing on your community resources, and you've all said something about culture. And I know that in Southwestern City Schools, um, the PTA, you have a great PTA uh, going there, and I know they play a major role in your culture. So I wanted to um, ask, how do you engage your parents, and how do they, because they're, they're essential in, in learning, and um, how do you engage them, and and how do you keep them motivated, if at all possible? And what role do they play in your culture? Um, one of the things that we've learned very clearly is that we need to ask before we do. And uh, for, uh, for example, um, we have for years created uh, parent education components. We never asked what they wanted. We thought they knew what they wanted, and so we had a monthly seminar, <laughs> and some would show up. We found out that actually when you ask and give them what they would like, they show up, <laughs> even without food. I, it's a wonderful, yeah. So um, one of the things we tried to do is we tried to change our model so that we're actually asking questions. What do they need? What do they want? Um, how can we be best of service? So that's been a significant component. I would say the other piece um, from a recent conversation that may tie in here is also the third grade reading guarantee. We weren't sure how parents were going to react, especially a kindergarten parent. I mean, welcome to Southwestern City Schools. We know based on crawl data that we're one of the lowest as far as students entering school, we're always in the bottom four. Sometimes we've been last and our students being prepared for kindergarten. So welcome to Southwestern City Schools. Here's a letter your child's not on, on track and they may be retained, welcome. <laughs> we weren't sure how that was gonna fly. Um, so what we really are probably as excited about as anything, parent response has been fa fabulous. Their questions are, how do I engage with you and how do we work together to move this forward? And so, you know, I, I guess I can go with the Canadian version. I think that third grade reading guarantee truly is well-intentioned. We want students to read on time. Well, we'll find out whether it was, how well it was executed here at the end of the day, but where we're at at this point is, that's a great opportunity where parents can have hard data to say, you know what, based on where we think today, and we actually, K through four, notified 33% of our students that they were not on track. So it wasn't small numbers. Um, when you take a look, we're about 15 to 1600 a grade level, and we're notifying about 33% of them that they're, they're at risk. And so we see those as opportunities, not to judge, but to say, here's where we're at, let's work together. And parents want that. When you, the worst thing you can do is go to a parent teacher conference and have somebody tell you you're not the parent that needs to be here. Mm. What? Don't say that. Everybody wants the best for their child, and they're looking for ways. They want to know what they're doing well. They want to know what they can improve on. In my previous district, before I got here, one of the things we did is we actually eliminated the second parent-teacher conference, and we put a four-year um, planning session together. So every parent and every student got to sit down and work through their four-year plan, got to schedule for their next year classes. You know how many, how wonderful it was to have students placed correctly, not based on what necessarily they wanted, 
because it's amazing when mom and dad are sitting right there and I say, are you sure that's the course that you want? You sure? Now, you understand, and it would be the elbow across and all of a sudden, we're making another course decision. Yeah. You know, you would be a little better prepared if you took the, actually the advanced placement version of this versus the regular. It's not going to hurt your GPA. You'll still be competitive. You know, it's really not about the GPA from here. It's about the next level and make sure you're prepared. Those conversations were wonderful. And so when you invite people in, you talk about the good things, you talk about the opportunities, we see engagement happen in wonderful ways. And we truly are blessed with a wonderful PTA structure and a wonderful group of parents that engage with us on a regular basis. And we think we've gotten better at that because we ask them what we want and we talk about what we can do for their child with them, not for them. Amy, did you Sure. Take that? Um, we have a couple of systems at Metro. One is an advisory system. So every student is assigned to an adult who's their advocate and knows them really well. So when we think about a building of, you know, 400 students, it can be overwhelming for an administrator or even a team of, you know, adults to know those kids well. But when we're talking about one teacher, one adult being sort of responsible for 15 to 20 kids and their parents, that create, it gives parents sort of a go-to, a point of contact. So that's one way. Um, the structure of our building, which you will see when you come, my office is right in the middle of the building, glad, big, huge windows. It's not hard to find me. You don't have to walk through a maze to ask a, someone to please, is she available? I mean, you can see if I'm there or not there. So uh, th that certainly sends a message to parents about whether we really want to have contact with them or not, um, how our building is laid out. And then a couple of smaller things that we do in our advisory system, part of the students um, annual progress is a sit-down conference with their parents and a trusted adult and a community member sometimes. So we have these systems built in that sort of command that everyone come to school for their kid, you know, and that has shown some great results. Greg, the taker on that question. Um, well, we too have an advisory system. We call it CREW at our uh, expeditionary learning schools. Um, and it has much the same uh, effect as what's been mentioned. Um, one other thing that we have initiated are interim assessments uh, that uh, give, uh, they're formative assessments, so they're giving us a diagnostic partway into the learning so that, and then meeting with students about where they are so that they can, again, start to take more control of their own uh, learning needs. Um, it also helps the teacher to know what it is that students need rather than us teaching what it is we believe they need. We can actually know what they need in terms of a subject. So our interim assessments um, that were, you know, we're not fully, have not fully implemented this, but we will be fully implementing this next year, um, are giving us some wonderful diagnostic information that empowers our students and causes them to then, uh, the norm or the culture is that they are more in charge of their learning. Mr. Chair and then Ms. Tyson. Yeah, just, um, this has been Fantastic, <clears throat> and as often happens in these kinds of discussion, my head hurts because I'm trying to, there's so many issues you've touched on. Um, so I have an observation and a question. The observation, and I really like this, this chart which sort of talks about this confluence, and I, I totally agree we're at sort of a unique point. Obviously in our own city we have some, um, real, some things we want to get done and, and some important things, but around us there's this extraordinary thing happening, right? Um, and... Um, and just an observation, I, I had a chance to hear um, uh, uh, in, in a meeting so with Malcolm Gladwell, who you know is, is written about innovation, and he said something very interesting about this, the young generation of millennials, and, <clears throat> and it really connects to some of the things he said. He, he was talking about, we all learned by going to a classroom where someone talked to us, sent us off for homework, and we scrambled with that, and then we came back. And that was sort of the way many of us learned. And, he's, and what he was saying was that this generation is doing it a different way. They are learning horizontally from the system around them, which is incredibly full of information, it, some of it accurate, some of it not. And when they come back together, it's a chance to figure out how to practice it, to do something with it. 
And in your, each of you in some ways are saying that that's what we've had to do in classroom is to change the way classrooms. So one of the questions is how do we systematize, so, so you're doing it, um, many of you, in, in, in your classrooms. How do you systematize that? How do you, how, is that something that's very important, sort of to change the way we think of the classroom and what actually happens in the classroom, what happens out of the classroom? Is that something we think is important? And if it is, is there some way that we should be um, systematizing that? Um, just question mark. So is that, is that shift meaningful um, in terms of where the classroom is used? Um, I, I'm going to use the early college uh, experience as something that I think is important. Um, a lot of students don't want to go to an early college high school. They like their traditional school. Um, and so, you know, despite um, Metro and the Charles School being just, and Afrocentric being wonderful schools, it's not for every kid. But there are a lot of students in our traditional high schools who could absolutely benefit from the skills and the nurturing that's going on in those early college high schools. So I, I hesitate to use the word early college light. Um, and my purest uh, intermediaries and, and people around the country, you know, are maybe might recoil that. But I do think we need to design something to make this more systematic uh, in terms of preparation for college. We need to systematize a way that what it is we're doing at the early colleges can be done for kids at other schools. So our school is on uh, the, the Near East side. It's in the Brent Nell building. We're uh, business partners with Columbus Schools. Um, and Mifflin is not, not far down the road. You know, I bet you there's students at Mifflin High School who could benefit. And so we've, you know, just had some exploration about how we might do that. And I think that if we could take the things that uh, it, it succeed in schools and, and get to the essence of what it is that's succeeding rather than seeing the structure as being the key. And then finding a way to implement that with um, other high schools that we might fire up 25 kids in another high school or more who could take advantage of that work. I mean, I think that, you know, again, back to leveraging. Now go. Uh the way we talk about that conversation is, is what we're talking about is the transformation of the teacher from a part, being part of the delivery system to the broker. Mm -hmm. um, and we see technology as a big component of that. Um, I can give you an example. We have a Milken Award winner at our career academy. We have our own career center. Um, she does not teach chemistry from the traditional way that we all learned it. Here's the periodic table, here's the theory, learn it. Now finally one day a week you get to go to lab and do it. I mean, you walk in and she'll blow something up. And now your job is to go ahead and figure out What's the principle at work? And so they're working from a complete problem-based approach and it works backwards, it's called modeling. Um, and that's the way that they teach chemistry now in three of our four buildings. The one, we just had a change in staff, so I think they'll get there, but it, it, it speaks to the component. I will tell you from my perspective, we have staff hungry to go there, but the slide that uh, Mr. Fingerhut showed at the beginning that essentially read to me, 90% say they've had problems with technology working. Yeah, it's about friction. If I can't rely on the video to run, if I can't rely on, the, on it to be flipped in order for me, if it can't be delivered and I'm, I'm stuck now with plan B and I've got an hour of 25 kids, oh, death. Um, so, you know, that, that friction point and the ability to use that and rely on it, from my perspective, is the biggest component from us being able to completely flip that. Well, what's interesting, though, is you did say that, so you... you gave the flexibility and the autonomy to those teachers to do it in their way to create, whether we call it mastery, I don't know, whatever, use the jargon, but that, that to me is also an issue, which is if they were rigidly boxed in that says, this is, how, this is the book, you have an hour, this is what they're supposed to cover in that hour, versus somehow you enabled that flexibility. And I, and I think that's right to, 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 to do it in a way that they thought would create the outcomes that they were looking for. And, and I'll just, not to monopolize, I'll quickly give you, if you haven't caught on, I believe in frameworks pretty strongly. Yep. Our framework is based on uh, Ralph Taylor, 1949, the fundamentals of curriculum instruction. What do you want kids to know and be able to do? Yep. What evidence will, accept, will you accept that they 
can do it, understand it, or demonstrate it. Third block, and we call these our basic building blocks, and we actually still print them in our, in our professional development brochures and the whole thing. Third building block is what quality lessons will you provide or experiences for them to engage in it. And the fourth building block, and that's the last one, is um, if they don't understand, how will you redo it? Longer, louder, slower are not options. <laughs> So how can I do it differently? And that's our building blocks, and that's where, that's our framework. All PD fits within that framework. All teachers are expected to operate. When we do data teams and they get together in a collegial fashion, they're focused on one of those building blocks. How they do it, what they do, what resources they engage, that's their professionalism. Go at it, have fun. A quick, just quick build off that. I mean, it's a great but messy question, so I'm gonna look at just a little slice of it. In a Facebook age, social capital trumps human capital. And education and teaching as a solitary activity can't cut it anymore. And so one of the answers, I think, is collective effectiveness. I mean, there's growing research that shows that places where teachers are working with other teachers, learning from other teachers, using different technologies so they can be more of a coaching, but more of a collective effectiveness, social capital leveraging of the adult talent in a place is hugely important in this millennial move. There's the millennial t uh, uh, learner experience, but there's the millennial teacher experience, which is a social enterprise, and not an individualistic enterprise anymore. So we've got to look at ways, and I think that's what Southwestern does a lot. Ms. Tyson. Oh, that's right. Thank you. And, and you're partially answering something on my, this question, but it's, I really appreciate First of all, the four of you making this presentation today. And what I'm really struck by, and this is where everybody happens to be, is that the key is that you're meeting people where they are. I mean, you're meeting children where they are, and each of us that sit around this table, you meet us where we are, and we learn from there. And so, just under, I want to understand this shift, because certainly it is a shift where meeting children where they are. We know that in the past, classrooms have been, you may have a child that in your classroom that is in the fourth grade reading at the first grade level and that child just cannot keep up because of where they are so how did you I mean I understand what you're doing at Metro I've heard some of the things that you talked about all of you talked about parents being involved I've heard what you've done at Southwestern schools but just let's talk about the shift of going from that child that's reading at the first grade in the fourth grade and meeting them where they are, how, do you, how are we making our shifts to be able to meet those individual needs of those students? I think uh, the first part of the answer to your question is a system that's flexible. So in a lot of schools, we have systems that are really great for the adults, but the kids are the ones that have to kind of shift and mold and fit and try to pick one of these menu options, right? But at Metro, and really at, at most high at all high-performing schools, the system is a great place for the kids to be, but the adults in the system are the things that have to flex. So in your example of a, you know, a fourth grade classroom with students reading at first grade, it might mean that the teacher needs to think differently about what kinds of groupings are we going to have in our class every single day of the week. What kinds of technology can I use to subsidize the education of these students, but maybe these students don't need it over here. When Bill said his teachers become brokers of education, that is the perfect example of a teacher who is evaluating resources and evaluating mechanisms and using a framework to guide their decision-making process, but making decisions in their classroom that are right for kids. I think we've done a great job of meeting children where they are, um, by and large. What I think we haven't always done a great job of is taking them to where they need to be. And that um, we are not, you know, as, as uh, schools and educators, our, this is going to sound funny, but our, our main job is not to make people feel good. We are not in the business of making people feel bad. We should not have children feel bad about what it is, where they are, or anybody else who's working with us. But we are in the business of helping children learn and helping them grow. And that, so meeting them where they are is the necessary first step, but that is not sufficient. And we have to 
figure out then that strategy. And sometimes it is grouping. Sometimes if a kid is in the fourth grade and can't read, they need to, they need to learn how to read. That, that's what they need, and they need extra time on that. And if it takes away from something else, well, I'm sorry, but if you can't read, you're not going to be able to do anything else you need to do in order to be <laughs> successful, to be productive, and I would even say to have a life filled with meaning. So, because a life filled with meaning and productivity is ultimately what we're about. So I think we're decent about meeting kids where they are, but I think that the shift has to be in back to not judging. This is just you know saying this is important for you to know how to read. That you know then designing that, and and so you know there's a lot of things that we know about how to help kids learn how to read. And that's what we have to be about. We have to be single focused about our mission being to help children grow into lives of productivity and meaning. There were two things that came out of our buildings that we borrowed from some of our high performers. Um, one was a concept that every, every, every classroom teacher is the primary interventionist. We're not going to pull kids out and fix them somewhere else. When, when that came from one of our buildings, it resonated in such a way that made sense. And that really led to a second conversation about really understanding um, uh, the articulation or, or how the subject matter grows and where it came from. Um, we talk about uh, curriculum ladders and vertical articulations, a lot of those things. But to put it in the context for our conversation, this is the bottom line of can the Algebra One teacher tell you why you're solving that equation? Yeah. What's the purpose? Do they really know where it's going? And do they understand the prerequisite skills that fall short mm -hmm. for the student that can't? What we found is we hadn't done enough work, so they really understood what is a first grade teacher doing to teach comprehension skills. If they don't have it, what are the components? That, they couldn't diagnose it enough. And so that kind of medical model uh, approach, you know, I, I never want a doctor to look at me and say, I can't take you, you're too sick, you'd ruin my record. Uh, you know, I want them to take them based on whatever my blood results say and, and make me better. And that's what we need here, too, is, is we want them to understand, but they needed some additional tools. So those were the cultural components that helped us shift. Just quickly, I would say one thing is shift, quality feedback. The essence of any shift is quality feedback. All right, Ms. Rhonda Johnson. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm just cheering over here. You don't see me, but I'm cheering because teachers in Columbus would love to be in your schools and what you're doing and giving them more autonomy. And that's all I'm going to say about that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, no, we need um, you to say more. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to say more. Um, but, um, you know, teachers are learners, too. In order for us to be successful, we have to have learning experiences and we have to have professional development. Do you provide or have you thought about, and Brad, have you, on your visits, um, provided expeditionary experiences for the teachers so that they can connect what happens in the classroom with what really does happen in business? Um, because, you know, teachers in, in, my, um, in my schools may not necessarily know what that wrench is and that electricity and all of that, but maybe in the summer they could go to the business or um, training center to get some of the skills so they can help mm -hmm. the students connect with the work that they're going to do. Yeah, I'll just be quick on that. And in fact, one's local. They, all four, five systems, that's a key focus, peer-to-peer uh, -peer exchange, peer-to-peer -peer sharing. And just give you an example here. Ontario has a relationship with Kent State that has an online and face-to-face -face ex expeditionary experience with Ontario teachers and teachers that are connected with Kent State University aspect of it. That from what I picked up is just going gangbusters on that. So I agree with you totally from our global trips. The more you can design successful conditions in which fellow professionals can learn and grow together in efficient and effective ways, it's really key. We have uh, never experienced the kind of uh, professional development like we have with the Expeditionary Learning Organization. And they design all of their seminars, all of their uh, conferences to be learning experiences for the teachers that are, and part of it is what you bring back and how you then come back and share with each other what it is you've learned, integrate it into the classroom, and then evaluate that again. Um, Talking about partnerships, we're exploring with Fifth Avenue uh, International School 
how we, uh, a Columbus City School, how we, a charter, they, a district school, might work together around EL, around this whole notion of professional development. I think that that would be a fantastic outcome of this commission if there were exchange programs in place in um, businesses where teachers could go to the business for a few days and someone <laughs> from the business could come to the school and provide some expertise and some content. And we've done a little bit of that, but it's mostly been tied to the university. So summer opportunities for students or for teachers in a research lab or in a on a project, but it's always been organized through the university, not through the community at large. But a really small way that we do that is, and it's not insignificant small, it's just only once a term, but we do have students engaged in interdisciplinary projects and we require that there's an outside expert who comes in to evaluate. So that person can provide teachers and students actually some really authentic feedback around is this work really sort of industry standard or not. But I'm telling you, that would be fantastic if there were a catalog of options. And I'll, I'll go a little different direction. Sorry to throw the wrench on this one. But uh, from our perspective, it goes back to our definition of broker. We would actually rather have you be the broker and use the outside resource to be the deliverer, not where we have to have the training and understanding ourselves as the educator. Mm -hmm. But between Skype and, and videotape and technology and teleconference, all those other things at this point, they're just too much out there. Plus, it becomes more authentic from the students when they actually see that business person and they can tie in those resources. So we would go back to, we, we think those connections are very important, but we would rather have the, the uh, professional teacher stay in the broker role instead of the leader role. Um, but we think the concept of, of tying that in makes a lot of sense. And to build quickly off that, I know I think you have your February 8th on teacher quality, but to build off that, if you... I would, if you haven't looked at it, look at personalized learning networks, educators' personalized learning network, which is a growing way to organize an educator's social capital network to not only get better and improve their own practice, but to delegate and divvy out stuff. So personalized learning networks, I think, is a growing device that's getting at what Bill's talking about. Thank you. And Alex, since you opened up, and then I'm going to turn it back to Mr. Chairman, um, with your first question, I'll let you close with the last question. Well, it's, it's really not a question. It's more of an observation. F first, from the private sector corporate viewpoint, I, I, I think if I look at the 40 members of the Columbus Partnership, George, I would dare say that the commitment to coaches in the executive boardroom uh, and professional development throughout the entire organizations is a common thread. It's uh, something that CEOs embrace, not fear. It's not about failure. It's about success. Uh, so just kind of to reemphasize, you know, that this whole piece of the conversation. Secondly, and, and forgive me if it's coming out, it's to the co-chairs. Um, I'm struck by being a product of a mom and dad who spent 70 years in the classroom. And as inspired as I am by these best practices of principals and superintendents, I'd love to see a similar conversation with teachers. Uh, because I learned at my dinner table growing up that there was always frustration from that. Um, uh, and, then, and then secondly, uh, and I'm gonna, I want to delicately ask this question, or maybe not so delicately, but leave it to the co-chairs to figure out how and whether or not this would be appropriate. Uh, yeah. it, um, these are the best, the best superintendents, the best principals, at least as measured uh, the, the, the school buildings and the districts that they represent are the best. I'd be interested in inviting in uh, out of Franklin County uh, those that perform uh, at the bottom of the scale, not as a uh, symbol of you know beating anybody up, but we're trying to learn, trying to understand, I'm trying to think about correlations. Um, and so is there a way we could have a constructive, productive uh, conversation and give uh, uh, those that are representing the school buildings and school districts in our community uh, a voice uh, to understand uh, their perspective uh, you know juxtaposed against what we've heard at this meeting in the previous meeting uh, you know what it's interesting and I'm going to clo close it out mr. chair if that's okay you know one of the questions that um, was written down for me to ask um, these educators today was basically what are the barriers to high student achievement 
And um, as we heard from the panelists today, uh, failure is not an option. And that barriers, um, that they don't even deal with barriers at all. That they recognize they exist and they move beyond them. And so um, it's interesting, Alex, that you uh, posed this last um, question and observation. And I will be curious to see how um, Chancellor Fingerhut and the co-chairs decide on how we're going to move forward uh, with that recommendation. But having said all that, we are at uh, the 1130 hour to close out this uh, portion of this. And this has been a very rich rich discussion and, and, and you made my job easy so thank you uh, very much. So, uh, so Mr. Chairman based upon what we've been doing thus far um, I guess I would like to make a recommendation to you and Madam Co-Chair that uh, we take the information that we learned and heard today and um, we direct uh, the administration, Commission administration to come back with a framework of what we heard and what those recommendations for continuing and moving this discussion on um, designing success and measuring success actually should mean. Um. Uh, yeah, Stephanie, that sounds great. Um, again, I think for all of us, it's like, what do you now what? You know, what's the next step? And I think that's right. We, we probably need to think about some kind of framework mm -hmm. for trying to capture this. We've heard a lot today, um, certainly about sort of how we might think about defining success other than certain test scores, right? Because we've all said it in a bigger sense. And then the question is, are there, there are probably a thousand different steps, but are there 10, whatever, is, is, are there gonna be a series of things that we know are the, are the must-haves? And I think maybe that's one way for us, if that makes sense, to think about um, trying to work on a framework. But this has been uh, fantastic. The one thing, I, I just wanna say something that I love about, about all the work that you're doing and what you're saying. You've all had to describe um, sort of living in, in, in the world as it is, exactly as it is, and, w and winning in that world, having to, to, to do with it, and also trying to have a foot in a world that we're imagining that could be, and it doesn't have to be impossible. And, and that's a challenging thing to do, but I love the fact that you don't say, um, hey, this is the way it is, and therefore we can't do that. We recognize that we have to deal with sort of both the current reality, whether that's a metric that's been handed to us or, or something else. But I really appreciate uh, your capacity to do that, your willingness to do that, and your leadership. So thank you so much for being here. Ah, I'm so, you, you want to say something? Yeah. Yes. Um, well, I wanted to say thank you for coming out. I really appreciate it. It was so much information that I wish that we could keep you here um, as hostages all day because um, I had so many questions. Yes and I wanted to hog the mic, but I wanted to make sure that we could get um, Dr. Mitchell's um, slides. Um, I was just gonna, you know, it's, I, th that's my oversight. I was gonna mention that they are not in your book, they are coming. Okay. So we will get that, so, so I, 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 I regret not mentioning that. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all, again, thanks to all the panelists. <laughs> and to, uh, Thanks to the panelists and, and to really Stephanie like Hightower for moderating this morning. It was really terrific, and uh, we'll, we'll figure out some way to respond to your, uh, your call for us to put a framework around this. Um, so here's the next steps. The lunches are, are behind that door where Mark Reel is now standing, uh, uh, through the exit sign to the left. Somebody will show you. They're set up for us. You've got your names on it. And so members of the commission and our invited guests, please... Uh, 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 grab a lunch, use the facilities which are out that way, uh, make your phone calls, check your emails, whatever you have to do. Uh, but we're going to reconvene, bring your lunches back to the table. We're going to reconvene in 15 minutes. So we're running a, about to seven minutes late. So we'll reconvene at five minutes to 12 uh, to begin our afternoon program. And we really have to start our lunch program to start on time. Thank you. All the teacher faculty, I appreciate Thank you for making my job easy. Great job.